Okay. Yeah, in memory of John Madden. Well, you see, you've got your host list over here and you've got your drive slots over here. Is there a way to clear that off? Yeah, okay. Hopefully you guys can hear me. It seems to be, microphone seems to be microphonating. Okay. Yeah, getting a nice little set of people. I think we'll wait like maybe five or six minutes for more people to show up. And I will let people in as I see them in the waiting room.
Okay. Looks like we've got video. Okay. Okay, we'll wait a couple more minutes and get started. Good morning. Good morning. I'm fascinated by what you're doing. Absolutely fascinated. Don't understand it, but I'm fascinated. Okay. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Got a few more people trickling in. I need to check one more thing because it looks like something happened. Okay, Norman's here. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> I, I'm tired of shoveling. <laughs> I couldn't imagine that. I saw the pictures and gee. Yeah, it's only, I... only three and a half feet. Yeah. <laughs> I've... I haven't I haven't had to deal with that much snow since I left Boston. Okay. Mm. Yay. <sighs> okay. Well, we've got, I think uh, if people come in, I'll take and admit them as I see them. Uh, but uh, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Uh, I will start off by welcoming everybody. Hi, how are you all? Uh, glad you all could make it. Um, I will admit up front that I am in the middle of recovering from COVID. So 
uh, I might sound a bit under the weather, but uh, all I ask is that you try to bear with me as I take and try to work through this. The other thing uh, that I would like to bring up is that I'm basically winging this, as they say in the wing business. So uh, it's um, the whole point here is for me to kind of do a walkthrough of the FujiNet <laughs> firmware and how it relates to the code that's on the target side the for the target computer, be it the Atari, be it the Atom, the Apple II, whatever. And as such, this is kind of informal. There's not really uh, there's not really a format as far as lecture or anything like that. So if someone has a question, if someone wants to bring something up, feel free to just interject. So this is kind of an open forum here. And the purpose of me doing this is to try and get the knowledge that's in my head out to all of you to at least get started and to understand a bit about what is going on underneath uh, with regards to FujiNet. Okay, we've got one more person coming in, cool. So with that, let's start with just a very basic introduction here. So what is FujiNet? Well, it's a Wi-Fi network adapter. It's a super peripheral. It provides a whole bunch of uh, it provides a whole bunch of devices in one device. Most commonly, and what most people will be using it for is for virtual disk use, so that you can take and mount disks over the internet, read and write to them. Uh, but we also provide a virtual printer. We also provide a network card, uh, which does protocol offloading. And I'll be spending a good chunk of time showing how this actually works, particularly in how we have protocol adapters, which help take care of the heavy lifting on the FujiNet side so that the computer can concentrate on what it does best ultimately, which will probably be display. Um, there are other devices and things built in as well. The Atari version has CPM emulation. Uh, a speech synthesizer, etc. Basically, things that we can put on here because we have on various targets not only this big, huge microcontroller, but we have access to the I/O pins on each target yeah. to do things like send audio back, etc. This particular website right here is FujiNet.online, and of course. It gives you links to uh, a number of different things, including how to get the latest firmware for those of you who are using production units and want to update your production software, uh, as well as support. But for the purposes of our talk here, the most useful link here is the wiki. And the wiki uh, will bring you to all of the community documentation that myself and others are putting together so that uh, we all can have something. Uh, essentially, this was meant to be the single place for documentation. Uh, I will state that currently right now, because FujiNet started on the Atari, there's a lot of Atari specific documentation. So uh, if some of you want to help take and organize some of this into different platforms, et cetera, if you can help out there, that would be absolutely wonderful because some of this does need to be slightly compartmentalized. But for firmware developers, the best thing that you can literally start with is the board bring up instructions to bring up your, uh, your, development, uh, uh, your development kits. Now you can use a uh, you can use an existing FujiNet device, or you can use something like uh, an ESP32 Dev Kit C, which you can put onto a breadboard as your development system. <coughs> uh, 
They're very inexpensive and very easy to take and wire up. Once you have everything set up, you have your environment, which we're currently using Microsoft VS Code as our uh, development environment of choice. And it all runs under a framework, which is called Platform IO. And Platform IO gives you a huge framework to take and build embedded projects of all shapes and sizes. It also, it provides all of the different frameworks that you have, that you can use to have available to build embedded projects, such as Arduino and ESPIDF, which is what we're using. It also provides unit testing frameworks and uh, really, really comprehensive support for a huge amount of hardware. So if we needed to, for some reason, to move to a different board target or whatever, we could very easily. And in point of fact, this has already been proven quite nicely uh, by the fact that a contributor has basically taken the FujiNet code and made a version that can build and run on standard PC hardware. This is very useful for uh, running FujiNet alongside an emulator, for example. But what do we, once you have a board bring up, what are you left with here? You're left with this large chunk, what looks like a seemingly large set of files which comprise the FujiNet firmware. Most of it is inside this library directory. And this basically tells you more often than not here that FujiNet is in reality a huge collection of code libraries to provide a whole bunch of, to provide all of its functionality. We have libraries to take and abstract out each of the different bus types that we are using, such as AtomNet for the Coleco Atom, IEC for the Commodore 64, Commodore 128, and SIO for the Atari. These provide the basic functions that you need for each bus to do things like communicate between the computer and the peripheral, to do various handshaking functions, such as acknowledging requests, non-acknowledging packets, indicating that requests are complete or if something went wrong, et cetera, as well as any utility functions that you might need for a particular computer target such as uh, getting parameter values from a command frame and SIO or calculating a checksum. In addition, the bus class also defines how these devices relate to each other, how many of them there are, the different types that are available for the different targets and methods for adding and removing them from FujiNet's control starting everything up shutting everything down processing the commands that come across those buses etc But we also have, in addition, we have devices. And these devices connect to the bus to provide 
all of the functionalities that each device will actually need. as well as commands to take and send data to and from the bus, et cetera. You'll see that because each bus is different and because we have to take and do different arbitrations, different mediations between these buses, et cetera, these functions are all implemented a bit differently for each target. And we try to, the FujiNet philosophy here is to uh, integrate as much as we possibly can and present these abstract devices in a way for each, that makes sense for each target system. So for each one of these different targets, not only do you have bus, but you have a device library that's also broken out by bus type. And implementing functions for emulating a disk drive, providing the virtual keyboard on the Coleco Atom, Wi Fi modem the network card adapter, virtual printer, serial card, and so on. Each one of these is developed in such a way that makes the most sense for a given target computer. And you'll see that for each one of these, you have a similar set of files underneath. This is honestly where most of the firmware development actually occurs, is inside the device folder. Most of these other libraries are utility libraries that provide abstract functions for each of the devices inside the device folder mostly. You have, for example, an HTTP library for doing HTTP calls, libssh for providing the SSH adapter. You have network protocol, which is literally where all of the protocol adapters live and we're all the magic for translating between different network protocols and providing a nice clean IO interface lives. The virtual printers themselves live here under printer emulator. There is a uh, there is a Z80, a Z80 emulator and uh, sort of CPM, uh, virtual CPM device right here for systems that aren't running on Z80 so that they can too, they too can run CPM software. Uh, the virtual SAM device for voice output. The basic TCP sockets here for TCP and UDP sockets, DNS queries and so on, and so on. You get the idea. There is one folder here that is called utils and it is like in every large project. Every large project has a miscellaneous drawer. This is it. And it has everything under the sun for, for processing strings and doing all sorts of general transformations that really didn't fit into any of the other libraries. Hopefully we, we've managed to keep this relatively small. Maybe we'll keep it small going forward, who knows. 
So let's start a bit by doing a little bit of a functional demo of where we're at with the Coleco Atom here. I will temporarily put this into a monitor mode so you can see the debug messages going across. We'll do that by going into platform IO functions. And I have a FujiNet connected to my Coleco Atom here. Oop, there we go. And if anybody wants to say anything, I'm basically, I'm, I'm talking to try and keep things going and you know, potentially I'm billing air. So if anybody wants to mention something, ask a question, whatever, feel free to speak up. This is very informal. Does, is everyone on Discord? I guess is a question. I am. Any <laughs> Maybe we should give them the Discord to the uh, FujiNet. Yep, absolutely. We can do that right now. Let's see. So if I can see my window. Oh, I, I seriously. So, I mean, we have, the, we have this wonderful Discord here that, we, that you can get to. We'll get the invite link here. Give me a second. And I will take and paste and ate that. Thank goodness for two monitors. For anybody who wants to take and participate directly in FujiNet discussions, the Discord server is where this all happens. We're on there, I'm on there all the time. And you know, it's because I love doing this. So yay. Uh, Okay, so we have right here our debug monitor. I will take and gently push you over to the side here. And we have a Coleco Atom here on the right. <clears throat> and with all the FujiNets so far, they act as block devices and they expose a disk image that is on the FujiNet flash. It's actually in the data directory. I can take and show that in just a moment, uh, which contains the configuration program for a particular target. And with the way that we mount disk images, we have host slots where you can pick disk images from given hosts and you put them into disk slots. So right now we have, for example, uh, CPM 2.2 and assembler in the disk slot here. I'm gonna take, just as a little demonstration here, I'm gonna go grab a game real quick and I'm just gonna load it. We'll take and boot it. And as we boot it, you'll see the blocks, the different blocks coming across, being read, feedback from the atom. And because of the way the atom works, the atom can do this in the background while the game is actually working. These things stay in memory. So if I take and press reset again, they will take and load, uh, it will take and load what's already mounted. To get back to the configuration menu, you just need to reset the FujiNet by pressing the reset button. Pressing the reset button here shows the shutdown handler being called, everything unmounted, and the software is starting up again.
there are lots of debug messages that come across. And these are, uh, I sh I'll show how these debug messages are synthesized in just a moment. But they're very helpful, especially when you're taking and working on the firmware. Uh, so you can take and put any, you can, you can basically output whatever you can throw into a printf statement. So now that I've reset, we can come back into config. I will pick something from my SD card slot. It's just a host slot that I've called SD, the special name which means grab whatever is loaded on the local SD card slot. And I will put uh, CPM in here. Mount it, read, write. And you'll see as we're doing various things inside of config, you can see a set of Fuji commands are being sent across to the virtual Fuji device to do things like get the current adapter status, read and put the host slots back, mount a particular host slot, et cetera. Some of these actually culminate in uh, virtual file system calls, which may or may not go out to either the local SD card slot or to a TNFS file server, whatever. Calls for opening the directory, getting directory position for pagination, et cetera. Lots of, uh, lots of, debugging, and lots of debugging information shown here. Now for this next piece, I'm going to do a quick little demonstration of the network adapter and its um, uh, and the pro, uh, the network adapter and the protocol adapters and how they and how they're going how the user sees them. For that, I'm actually going to bring in another friend here. And I'm going to, this is an Atari 8-bit running the FujiNet PC inside of a, an Atari 8-bit emulator. And this is especially interesting because uh, if we could get a decent Coleco Atom emulator, for example, to take and connect this through, we could take and potentially add FujiNet support to it as well for software development purposes. Uh, or other targets for that matter. Apple win for Apple two. It doesn't, you know, it's, it, it's, all, it's all free game. So I'm gonna go to comms here and actually, no, not comms, I apologize. Networking. And I'm going to open up Netcat. Now, Netcat is an example program that I've put together uh, that basically allows you to, it's a simple terminal program that allows you to enter a network device specification and it will connect to it and provide both input and output for it. The source code for it is actually on the wiki in multiple different languages so you can see how these things are actually implemented. And this is essentially the, uh, the demonstration program here, but I'm showing you running this on two different platforms so you can see how this actually fits together. 
to do it, we need to take an ender and a device spec. So for example, I'm gonna open up a Telnet connection. And we're going to see that it's opened up a, it's opened up a Telnet connection to this BBS here. And you'll see that I'm actually about to do the exact same thing over here on the Coleco Atom. So you can see same device specifications here. They're both using the same code. The difference is essentially in how each of the network devices are implemented inside the device folder to connect those protocol adapters together. So Tom, is the, the Telnet um, Protocol adapter, is it the same for both the Atari and the AtomNet? Is that, is, are you calling the same library? Yes. In exactly the same fashion. That's okay. So then it, it's the network device that's that has to be specific for this target platform. Correct. Bit. Okay. Correct. Absolutely. So essentially, your job at, in the device folder is to essentially take and uh, couple the bus and implement the devices that make sense for that bus. And for the network device, your job there is to basically make it so that you can call all of the different protocol adapters. I'm gonna go ahead and log off here. And just to really kind of put, pull this across here, it doesn't matter what you use uh, for the protocol adapters, essentially what gets exposed by the protocol adapters is a nice clean IO channel. It's all the same. So if you do, for example, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I apologize, fellas. you'll see that it doesn't, it can access, you access HTTP sites in exactly the same way. You access FTP in exactly the same way and so on. And you can do all sorts of interesting things with this using the same methodology. I can grab a file just as easily 
from a web server or an FTP server as I can from my local Windows file server. Thomas, quick question. Yes. When you mention HTTP, are there any browsers available for the Atom that this will work with? No, they don't exist yet. That's what I thought. Thank you. I'm going to log in to my Windows file server real quick. And what I've done here is I'm basically saying for any adapter that I connect to now use these credentials. And I am going to Oops, Oops. Firmware is still slightly glitchy, guys. Yeah, bear with me there. But you can see right there, bam, we transferred the file over. Let's see. It may have been a stack overflow. We'll see. Again, like I said, firmware is still pretty much in progress. And I'm going to show you some of the things that I'm having to deal with in just a moment. Ah, yeah, I didn't make it over. Darn it. Oh, well. All right, we'll, we'll skip past that. Um, but you may have seen in some of the other videos, for example, that I used this exact same technique to take and read and write files onto a web server. And it, is, it does this by using the protocol adapters. So now that I've kind of given a sort of functional overview. And I'm guessing that most of you have seen the virtual printer, so I'll take and skip over that. But I'll take and now start digging back down into the code itself. While the target implementation of every machine is going to be different, we have the core libraries that take and provide all of the abstract functionalities that each target will actually need. And we start at main. Main is in the SRC folder here. And I'm going to take and pull you out of the way so we're not distracted. You can already see right here that we have a set of common bits of functionality that we're pulling in from different systems here. Things like FN system to do global system wide functions, etc. Wi-Fi functions, functions for the SD card. And it's really nice, especially in VS Code, you can right click, you can go to definition. And if you, have an, if you wanna know how something is implemented, you can drill down in to just about anything and see how the bits and pieces actually fit together. You'll already see that because we're a multi-platform code base, uh, yes, there are if diffs. If diffs are everywhere. If you guys can think of a better way to do this, then by all means, uh, whip something up and show us. Um, there is a, uh, uh, the philosophy here is, well, do it and do it, show us. And it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission, honestly. 
because we're all doing this for fun and there's the, we're not building we're not building aerospace software here so no lives at risk just just fun um You'll see that we have different if defs for different targets, such as Atari. You'll see the different devices for Atari here, for example, and you'll see the ones for Atom. These are essentially here because we take and reference them down in the main part of the code to instantiate various objects to get them started. Some bits and pieces of comments, some global objects, but where we start is all the way down here. <clears throat> Since this is ESPIDF, it uses a function called app main to start, and it needs to be done with C style linkage. And our main thing is that we call our setup routine. And once we call our main setup routine, we then take and set up a primary task which is the main FujiNet task that runs everything. And for right now, if you'll notice, this runs at a priority of 10. So positive, pro, pro, uh, positive priority numbers take precedence over lower, uh, over lower numbers. And there are negative numbers as well. Uh, so this is a very high priority task that's run. And we pin it explicitly to the first CPU. And create that task. And at this point, main just sits here. Doesn't do anything, it, it's done. At which point we have main setup, which is this thing right here. <laughs> Give us our debugging information. Now we have a macro, a set of macros here that are in debug.h, which give us a number of different print, different print commands that we use that immediately take and output whatever message you give to them to the debug UART. You may be asking, what's the debug UART? Well, that is all completely dependent on this class right here. And the UART manager that we have basically sets up all the UART mappings for the very various UARTs that we use for serial communication. We have a pin map as well that's an include which takes and maps all of the different pins of the hardware to where we can have access to them. And there are some special um, defines for my ghetto ass breadboard that I was using for Atom development, which I still have here. Uh, you'll notice that there are also additional pins on, diff on certain targets for special functions because different targets will need different numbers of pins and we'll have some things left over. So it's a case of, well, you know, we had two pins left over. Why don't we take and throw a USB port on the Atom version? Sure, no problem. We did that and we dropped in the pins right here. The goal here is to take and attach that to a soft HID implementation so that we can plug up a keyboard to that USB port. So your best friend, and I will keep saying this over and over and over again, go to definition, go to declaration, go to type definition inside of VS code. Go to references, see where these things are being referenced throughout the code. So you can spelunk through 
and work your way through the code very quickly and efficiently. We'll come back here. So back to the setup routine. If you've done ESP32 type stuff before, nothing, nothing too crazy here. We basically just try to bring the device up as best we can. Try to set up the keys, the buttons, the LEDs turn on the SPIFS flash. Um, the FujiNet contains uh, 16 megabytes of flash memory on the production units. This will vary if you're using development hardware. Some development hardware doesn't have flash memory at all. Some, I, some may have four, some may have eight megs, etc. cetera. Uh, we use some of that to store files and other things. I'll get into, as we get context into what gets pulled off of spiffs, I'll show what happens there. And we have, for those of us who have an SD card slot, we have SD card routines. Load in our configuration. Try to start up the Wi-Fi adapter if we can, if we have all the information that we need to for that. And then we start firing off setting up devices, set up our devices, get our bus wired up. Norman added a device here on the Atom side to try and figure out if a physical device exists outside of the FujiNet for something that we can potentially replace, such as the keyboard or the printer. This gets called and started up. And then we basically do things like, okay, we listen for status requests and things. And if something exists, then we attach to it or not. We set up various devices like the printer. We start any tasks that we need to start. And then once hey, we've- hey, Yes. Hey, Tom. Um, so, so someone had asked on the Discord about, you know, that they whether or not how Arduino like our code was. And one thing I wanted to point out of that FujiNet system, that FS system that's lying on 217. So there's a lot of helper functions that are implemented in an FN system like dot millis um, that are basically duplicating Arduino like um, framework calls. Exactly. Um, Oscar Fowler uh, was very instrumental in taking the code that we had originally written in Arduino and moving it over to ESPIDF. And in the process, we brought over a lot of Arduino framework code to do that. Uh, so yes, uh, ESPIDF with, some, with a lot of Arduino-like uh, conventions. Absolutely, good point. Uh, so once we get everything set up, at that point, the main setup leaves, we get our task started, and we have our main priority service loop. Now in ESPIDF, tasks are expected to basically just run in a loop. Uh, you really can't have one-shot tasks explicitly in ESPIDF. Uh, you can't eat, uh, the watchdog will freak out. You, there are ways around that, but uh, essentially uh, this just runs in a nice little loop. And since I have the Atom build here running here, we're essentially, since we started up our Atom net bus here, we just keep calling the service loop over and over. And then we finally take and do a little bit of yield so that we if we have other tasks that need to run, they can run as well. This of course means that free RTOS is essentially cooperative multitasking. So uh, tasks, are, uh, tasks are expected to yield if they can. If we go into service, 
Oh, come on, you. There. We basically, the service loop really for Adam, that's pretty simple. <laughs> we process, we look and see if there's anything available on the uh, serial IO UART, meaning that a packet came across. And if it did, well, we process it. Now, the way that these are actually implemented, this will vary depending on the target system that you're implementing here. In the case of the Coleco Atom, you have, uh, oh, there's people, sorry. Uh, yeah, there's people waiting. I apologize. Joining, joining. I hope you guys haven't been, I hope you guys haven't been waiting long. I apologize. I just now looked over to see that there were a couple people waiting in the hallway. Um, but in the case of the atom net here, we need to read the byte that is waiting for us, the first byte that is waiting for us, because that gives us two things. It gives us the device that this packet is meant for, and it also gives us a device ID. We figure out, uh, is, this, is this one of our devices? We do that by basically implementing a map of atom net devices to device IDs, which are called the daisy chain. And if something matches and the device, importantly, if the device is active, then we take turn on our LED we go ahead and set the start time for this because on this bus, packets have a lifetime, a very short lifetime, which, have to be, which has to be dealt with because it's expected that on this bus, packets are dealt with as quickly as possible. And if they're not, it's assumed that the device can't handle them and so they should be ignored. So we have to take and keep track of how long it's been since this whole process started. We then, for each one of these, we call atom net process, which is a virtual method that um, is implemented by each atom net device to take and process the packet. Now, for that, we need to drill down a bit further. Let's take, for example, the disk drive. We'll go into lib, device, atom net, disk. Each one of these devices is defined as an atom net device and as such has a number of methods to handle the bus messages for each thing that needs to happen, as well as the main process loop. You'll notice that this is very different from, for example, SIO. Very different. For those of you familiar with how the Atari SIO bus works here, you'll see some familiar bits and pieces. For SIO read, SIO write, handling status messages. And this is implementation specific for the Atari. And you'll see the difference in the process loop. Oh, come on, where are you right here? The process loop for this is very different for the process loop for the Atari SIO. 
And that's because these two buses function very differently. On the Atari SIO bus is very synchronous. While on the Atom, processing is very asynchronous and more network oriented. So we try to implement the best approach that will fit for a given bus. This is not a one size fits all ordeal. It can't be, it's not possible. I'd like to be proven wrong, but it's not possible. So I'll pull this out of the way for a moment. Once we get into atom net process here, we take that byte that we got passed in and we figure out what type of packet it is. And there are different packet types that, that occur on AtomNet for different things, such as when the computer requests the status for a device, whenever the computer says it's okay to send data back to it, uh, whenever the computer explicitly requests to receive some information, whenever the computer sends something in, uh, and whenever the computer says, are you, asks us if you're ready. Once we figured out what each packet is and what it needs to be done, then we go ahead and respond to it. Now, in this case, because a number of actions are common between AtomNet devices, it made sense to implement some of these command, these, these messages in the base class, such as responding to status requests, responding to ready, that sort of thing. We take and fill out the data structures that we need in order for our status requests to work. And then we use the various functions to send data back to the atom as needed or to receive it whenever we're needed. And the different convenience functions that are available for the different buses are here in and implemented in ways that make sense most conveniently for the different targets. Are there any questions so far? Anything I should drill into? Anything I'm missing? No, but it's starting to make a lot of sense now, Tom. Okay. Hi, Alan. Um, I, um, I'm just thinking here, like the implementation of this for a system is sort of two steps specific to a machine. So mm -hmm. you do your bus protocol implementation, yep. which I imagine is going to come down to um, pretty much electrical signals on the pin. Yep. To then give you um, a bunch of features to call with then your device uh, driver that you build. So if you're building a disk drive, that will then be able to call the relevant bus um, APIs that you've implemented to get the correct signals across to your target system. And on the back end, so the disk drive might then use a protocol adapter to access TNFS or something similar to act as like the storage medium. Yes. Is that roughly it? Yeah, that's pretty close. And I will admit that the, you're going to see some dip, some duplication of effort. And I apologize, mm -hmm. I apologize in, in advance because some of this really did grow organically, uh, particularly with regards to the network adapters and the Fuji device. And in fact, yeah, yeah I think I should, uh, I think I should actually talk a little bit about the Fuji device. Uh, you're going to see some, you're going to see some dichotomy here because the network device came later. 
and it might be in our best interest to try and mold some of this together. So, yeah. So, can so you? I know that you're <coughs> talking about the protocol adapters being sort of like the generic tool set for the FujiNet. So, yes. if you implement anything for any system, you can call these tools and move on. Yes. Um, they sound more like FujiNet features, and a subset of those would then be protocol adapters for HTTP. Yes. Something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. You saw, for example, here in the configuration program, this config program, regardless of where, what target it's running on, it is talking to what is called the Fuji device. And the Fuji device is essentially a, uh, it's a virtual device that controls that it's it's the giant control device for setting up the FujiNet. Its primary use is for setting up host slots and device slots, for mounting disk images uh, from remote systems uh, into uh, you know, basically mounting, mounting disk images in and getting everything set up. Everything that the config program needs to function essentially lives inside the Fuji device. So if we look, for example, in device, and this is where I said it is going to be some, some, some duplication because right now the Fuji device deals with the SD card slot and TNFS. It does not use the network protocol adapters yet. It should, but it doesn't yet. Again, this is because the network protocol adapters came later. But you'll see a whole bunch of interesting functions in here to do everything from uh, resetting the FujiNet to getting Wi-Fi scan results, mounting disk images, uh, you know, copying, copying disk images to local storage, for example, setting boot keys, the app key functionality, which is essentially uh, local configuration storage on the FujiNet is implemented here and so on. On the AtomNet, this is implemented as a, seri as a series of send packets, which may also give receive packets if there are responses. So you'll see in the Fuji device, the same AtomNet process loop here for processing the different packet types with the biggest one being this guy right here. This is when the Atom sends us a command. We then take and see what it is the first byte of the send packet gives us the command. This is how I specified the protocol. And then it takes and fires off to each individual command here. And as I said, each bus is different. Um, it's important to understand that on the atom net, it's a good thing to try and get all of the information of the, uh, of the packet as quickly as you can and indicate to the atom that you receive this information by sending back a response. This is fundamentally different to, for example, this is atom net open directory. If we look at SIO open directory. We'll see that the method is actually very different. But it's implemented using the methods that are in uh, the SIO bus here to take and do what it needs to do. Grab the information, calculate the checksum, send an error back. Otherwise, 
we process it. And because SIO essentially can wait until we signal a complete, we can go ahead and do our processing here and send back our response. Again, it's very synchronous. So every single bus will actually be implemented differently in this respect. So we essentially have, when we take, for example, to take and mount something, let's see, let's see here. You have all of these different functions to take and read the device slots, get the information in, get the information out, put it all together, get our checksum. Okay, great, this is great. We then take, since the atom is, is asynchronous here, we just go ahead and set up the response and say the response is, the, is that size right there so that whenever the atom asks for the receive, we send back the response. And so, The only thing about the, the only, like I said, the only thing about the FujiNet that really, well, the one thing about the Fuji device that really needs to be improved is that again, we're using the, we're not using the network protocol adapters and we really should be. Instead, we have our own methods here for taking care of our disk slots dealing with our disk devices, the media types that are in them, and so on. And that actually brings me to another point. Um, there is another library right here that differentiates by platform, and that is media. And the idea here is that you have uh, all of your self-contained uh, libraries here for dealing with different media types. You have a base class, which is common to all of them for dealing things like calculating sector sizes. For the Atari, you need to do things like uh, form a PERCOM block so that the uh, disk operating system can ask for uh, drive characteristics. And then, then so that when you actually drive down into each of these, you can do things like figuring out on the Atari, you need to calculate sectors to offsets, as well as uh, in the case of ATR, since there's a header in front of it, we have to take an uh, inch forward on the header, do all the sector calculations, do any reads that we need to do to get the data into block buffers and to send it back. The same for disk writes. Now you'll notice that, um, for example, for media types here, we have, we're using the standard C functions here which on the ESP32 are actually implemented as VFS calls. We have a VFS, we have a, uh, we have a VFS implementation. Uh, <clears throat> apologies. We have a VFS implementation, PNFS here, that uh, wraps so that you can basically, depending on what we're talking to, if it's the local file storage or if it's a TNFS server, we can do F seeks, F reads, F writes, et cetera. This is another difference. This isn't going through the protocol adapters, but again, this was because this was all written before the protocol adapters even existed. So you've got, that's for ATR, for example, but you also have others. Um, for example, some of these can get pretty intricate, such as, um, implementing the ATX file format, 
which for those who are unfamiliar is a file format for Atari 8 bits that preserves the copy protection by preserving not only timing information of each sector and the track layout of the disk, but also any information such as bad sectors, weak sectors, and the like. And so it all has to be emulated. And in this case, it's literally, if you see right here, <laughs> um, we are literally taking and throwing timers and converting time into angular velocity to figure out where we are in a given rotation. And some of these things are very time critical. So we have to take and turn on and off interrupts, for example. So there are a number of uh, macros to take and actually help with that. Port enter critical, port exit critical, which can be used for time sensitive code where absolutely you can't have anything messing with this. Hey, Tom, um, Peter has his hand up. Yeah, yes. <laughs> As always, uh, can I can I uh, make a question? Right yeah, do you just and and here, Peter, and for anybody else on this call, like I said, I'm concentrating on uh, on a whole different monitor. I don't see you guys over here on my other <laughs> monitor here. So if you want to say something, just say something. Okay. So, I will stop. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, hi, Thomas. Uh, <laughs> it's it's the first. First and um, and second, um, I have a few a few questions. Okay. First, but um, first, um, I'd like to understand that uh, this uh, ASP is multitasking or single task system. Multitask. So, it's it, so it's multi it's the, a the, the, oh, okay. But in inside there are um, many uh, some kind of. Um, scheduling systems for example uh, um, you showed us um, uh, main loop and yes. for example in this main loop um, uh, this main loop uh, uh, make a service for for a Fujinet bus and all devices but for example web server that is inside Fujinet is also uh, uh, in that loop, or this is another process inside uh, kind of operation system inside this device. The web server is implemented as a separate task. And actually, Moswald had to do some changes in the last week. He noticed he noticed something that that re that we really needed to do. And if you look through the change, if you look through the change logs, you'll see that we're yielding now in a lot more places. And okay. that's to literally let things like the web server and whatnot run when they can, run more often when they can. So, so uh, uh, if you have yields in the uh, source code, then this is a kind of task switching. Uh, Cooperative, system. yes. Yes, it's, it's so a- then, then not not a uh, full multitasking with uh, it is not preempt uh, but but okay 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 understand so this is the task switching system okay yes it's um it's a it's a real time operating system yeah cooperative <laughs> so yeah. um so yeah you have to and it's, this is especially important cuz i'll point this out again um the main priority for the FujiNet task is 10. So it is, it's got priority over everything else. So if we can, it's in our interest to try and yield whenever we can so that other things can actually function. Now, with that said, notice that we put the, we pin this particular task onto a particular core it's, it's, it's pinned on to CPU one, which is the app core. Now, uh, things like the network operations, the TCP IP stack, uh, all the networking operations, the uh, Wi-Fi, MDNS, all that stuff runs on 
core two. It runs on core two and it has and, and it has its own priority here. So those things, because they're running on a separate core, because they're pinned to that core, we're not in contention with them. So how many cores uh, have uh, has two. Uh, two cores? Okay. Two cores. So for example, uh, when um, <coughs> if we have a, a bug in 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 the code and uh, we enter into infinite loop. Uh, uh it will uh it will uh hang the device and we should reset it or uh, there is a internal process that could break there is a loop. there is a watchdog timer so if the okay. if the uh if the primary if the primary service loop uh hangs for whatever reason then the uh then ets will restart it Okay, so uh, I understand. So yeah, this it, is it that, throws an except it, it, if the watchdog timers get tripped, it throws an exception. So it's mm -hmm. a hard, it's a hard oh, yeah. reset. It's hard a reset. hard reset. <laughs> and in the um, in the uh, where is it at um, SDK config defaults? I think some of those watchdog timers time the timeouts are adjusted. Mm -hmm. um, I, I went through a recent. Uh, situation where I accidentally deleted that file, and so it created its defaults, and it turned out one of the watchdog timers was too short, and it was constantly um, crashing on me. So there are there there were some things that were set um, longer, and it's adjustable, and you can turn them off <laughs> if you want. But um, I guess we we are trying to use them so so that so that we get an exception thrown and. Yes, yes, and for those listening to this is uh, this is Jeff Peetmeyer. He is uh, he's working he's working alongside with me. And just to let you know, guys, some of you guys know uh, Jeff was the reason that we moved to Platform IO and how this thing escaped uh, the Arduino uh, IDE in the first place. Thank God. Um, because I'm not sure I would have had the uh, the strength to actually do it. And oh wow, we've got more people. Admit. Um, and uh, he is also very much responsible for uh, the virtual printer emulation that is sitting inside of FujiNet as well. Worked very hard on that. Uh, as well as, you know, basically building a complete PDF rasterizer from scratch. Um, and he is most recently involved right now with the bring up of the Apple II smart port version of the FujiNet. Now he brought up the watchdog timers uh, very specifically here because he is having to deal with some really, really really time critical code uh, in that we're having to basically, uh, you know, flip signals on the order, you know, flip signal timing on the order of like one microsecond. You know, <laughs> fun, fun, fun stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. Like I said, it's for, yeah, for, for better or for worse, whether or not it's ill advised or not to try to use the ESP to do sort of megahertz um, yeah. timing. I, you know, it's it seems to be working. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah, I, I, yeah, we, he's got it to boot. So this is this is good. He's you know, total replay works. Yay. So yeah, what was I think? Oh yeah. So okay. I have a, uh, one, uh, another question uh, yes. about uh, about uh, that uh, network features, network services that you told us that uh, are not implemented yet in the FujiNet device. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, tell us uh, more about okay. what 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 uh, uh, what will be the change? Oh well, okay, yeah, I can get to that in just a moment. Let me take and let me take and and tidy this up a little bit here. 
So essentially, Fuji device control control functions, everything needed for the config. And then you have, uh, uh, and of course you have, like I, I've made cursory mention here, the media library is essentially where uh, all of the disk specific bits for things like handling different media types are handled here, any blocking, deblocking that needs to occur, et cetera, as well as special, uh, special formats such as loading cartridge ROMs, loading XEX files, all of that's actually implemented here. <clears throat> now, uh, network protocol. Okay. <laughs> if we look at the network device, it's implemented like every other device in the FujiNet system. You have an entry in device here, and it has what you would expect as far as a process loop for here, you've got this. And then of course, in SIO, you have um, much the same thing here, but you'll find again, and, I'm, and, I, and I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but it's important to understand that the implementations of these of the individual devices here are specific for each target system. For example, on the Atari, we have, and we really need to utilize interrupts. So we have the, uh, the interrupt and proceed pins that we can deal with. So we set up, uh, we set up things like timers so that we can uh, rate limit dealing with the uh, interrupt flags, et cetera. And we have interrupt routines to take and signal whenever, so, that the Atari, so that we can signal to the Atari whenever there is traffic that needs to be dealt with. Whereas on the Atom, because everything is so asynchronous and so DMA'd, and it's expected that you poll for everything, there is no interrupt. This functionality is not over here at all and is implemented very differently. And it will be even more different for the Apple II. It'll be different for uh, the Commodore 64, or, you know, IEC and all of the other bus types. This will all have to be implemented differently. But we have some basic, we have some basic things that we try to implement. Again, we have command packets so that we can do things like open connections. And when we open a connection, for example, we grab all the bits and pieces. Now, since the protocol adapters were originally developed before we ever had a concept of taking this to multiple platforms, they kind, it kind of looks like uh, it kind of looks Atari underneath. So you've got two auxiliary bytes here for passing in parameters, such as the uh, read, write modes, whether or not you're going to take and turn on protocol translation uh, for character turn line feeds, that sort of thing. And grab the packet, set everything up. And then we instantiate the protocol, we close a protocol. If it's if there's already one running here on this channel, we take and close it. Otherwise we instantiate it. We go ahead and we parse the URL, we grab it in, we parse it. And this takes that n colon string that you saw earlier, pulls it all together determines if it's valid or not, and then starts to instantiate the protocol. And at this point, if we have a protocol, TCP, whatever, we call network protocol TCP, network protocol UDP, all of these things, and we pass in the buffers that are 
for this network device. At a receive buffer, a transmit buffer, and a out of band buffer for commands or whatever. It doesn't have to be used, but it's there. HTTP, SSH, SMB. Now I would argue that this probably needs to be, once everything's parsed, this should probably be moved to more commonplace so we don't have to implement it for every device, but we'll see. Now what's inside each one of these? Well, that goes down here. We have network protocol. We have the base class. This is the base network protocol class right here. Everything starts here. We have pointers to our buffers, initialization. We figure out if this connection is supposed to be a server, because if you specify, oh, there's no host name there. So it's gonna say, oh, you want a server connection. You want me to listen on port 6502 on a TCP socket there. Okay, no problem, I can do that. And the protocol will be made aware of that through this variable here. We have a single eight bit value to carry an error message. We have translation modes. Now this is something that's pervasive throughout all the protocols here because we have a very basic method of translation. And this is especially important because again, this started off as an Atari project. Uh, Atari does not use ASCII natively. It uses its own form of character encoding, which it calls a TASCII in which some of the characters have changed, particularly the end of line of meaning. Atari uses a single character, uh, hex 9b, to signify uh, an Ataski end of line char uh, carriage return. So um, this, you know, in ASCII, this can be one of three possible states. It can be either a single carriage return as on classic Max. It can be a line feed, just a line feed by itself, which is what you use on Unix, uh, or it can be carriage return line feed, which you'll see on MS-DOS machines, but you'll also see it in Telnet connections. You'll see it all over the place. There are different modes here and we need to take and figure out which ones they are. Uh, from interrupt and interrupt enable are there for, uh, for network devices that need it. But we have, a number of basic uh, IO operations that each protocol needs to be able to implement. We need to be able to open connections. We need to be able to close connections. We need to be able to read from a channel. We need to be able to write to a channel. We need to be able to ascertain the status of a channel. And we have the ability to send uh, special commands that may or may not require a response. And again, because these particular uh, idioms started on the Atari, uh, I used the D status uh, values here to indicate whether or not these particular special commands have a payload or not as well as special commands that do not require an existing connection to be open, such as file system commands for deleting something from a file system, that sort of thing. We also have a function here for translating um, error numbers to the 8-bit error numbers that the 8-bit error variable up top that will be passed back. Pointer to current credentials. I'm gonna take and extend this sum to do things like handle public keys and the like. And just various bits and pieces. Now the base class is kind of special because um, it has functions to perform end of line translation on data coming in 
and data going out. This is important, again, because uh, on certain systems, we need to be able to adjust the data that is being received from in, in the channel so that it can be un, so that it can be understood by the target system. Basically, set up the buffers. And when we're done with a protocol, we clear everything off, we tear everything down. The base class for things like open really aren't all that isn't much really going on. We just figure out whether or not we have translation modes that we need to worry about. <clears throat> Closing things off. And when we do a read or a write, we make sure that we translate the received buffers as we get them and so on. And this is the function right here inside network protocol that actually takes and does uh, end of line translation, common to all the protocols. Hey, hey Tom, um, Andy is being very polite with his hand up too. You guys just have yeah. to get around. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm just gonna. <laughs> no, no, it's cool, yeah. <laughs> I, I have like a more of a philosophical question. So I'm waiting for a break to ask. Go, no, go ahead and ask. I'll ask. Right. Okay, yeah. So this is stepping back a little bit. And again, as like, not, as a sort of a non-programmer, at least not a C programmer, I have a, a general question about the protocols and the disks and stuff. And it's this, like when, so just the disk mounting function and we'll say for Atari, right? It, the Fujinet emulates SIO, right, calls, the Atari thinks it's a disk drive, which is yes. a random device, and it's connected to, uh, through TNFS. What mm -hmm. I've just wondered is, does the FujiNet, like, pull the entire disk image back into its memory, and all the random access happens at the FujiNet, or is it literally, like, after it's booted, right, and the Atari wants to seek to block, you know, 800, the FujiNet seems to be going back out onto the wire, right, to the TNFS mount. That is a good. That is a good question, and that's actually the answer to that. Is it depends on the media type. So, um, for 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 discs that don't have any time sensitive copy protection, such as ATRs or XEX files you can seek and dynamically pull in the blocks that you need. And that's what the FujiNet will do. There's the inside of disk type ATR and disk type XEX. You will actually see that that's exactly what we do. Um, if we go over to here, you'll basically see that we are dynamically seeking to a particular spot and we're grabbing that particular we're grabbing that set of sectors now for this particular media type we try to get as much we try to read ahead a little bit and try to get the next eight or so sectors so that we can keep the performance up because nine times out of ten the reads are going to be sequential. Yeah, yeah, but it's you're still holding this like virtual SIO device across the entire internet, and if for some reason your Wi-Fi went dead, you essentially yes. like you turned off your 1050. It's yes. not. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now for disk types that for media types that require uh, time sensitive to be time, either time sensitive or just otherwise just time critical code, we have to bring the entire disk image in because there's no way to maintain timing otherwise. Yeah, and a lot of these are pretty small with modern like- Yes, so yeah, and we, you know, these most of these copy protected disk, it's 100K worth of data. So, okay, great. It pulls them in, keeps it in memory so that, so that it can read and write there, so. That's hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thanks. No problem. 
so once we get beyond the protocol base class here, let's look at TCP, for example. TCP, we don't really have much in the way of constructors. We just kind of, oh, hi, we're here now. We delete any server object, you know, create, you know, bam, set everything up. We have open. And as part of open, we're passed in two things. We're passed in the URL that we, that we were asked to open. And we were passed in the command frame, which is essentially, do we want to open this for read, for write, for read and write, et cetera, et cetera. We take our URL here, we parse it out. Okay, the host name part of this is empty. We open up a server connection. Otherwise, it's a client connection. Boom. And then importantly, we call the base class to do any house cleaning go up. So um, close is the inverse of this. Client object, stop it. Server object, stop it. Now, read and write. We ask for a number, we ask for a set number of bytes. We read them in. It goes back into the receive buffer. If we're not connected, we throw a network error not connected, clean everything up, and we indicate that an error has passed. Now for protocols, this is kind of the thing, the Boolean object, the return values here typically indicate whether an error has happened or not. Okay, we do the read from the client socket, we go ahead and bail if the connection is reset for some reason, basically just your typical defensive programming here. Anything that we need to do, any errors that we need to send, we go ahead and set up and do. And it's our responsibility inside the protocol adapter to handle them and to set the different errors and to send them back. Otherwise, if everything is good, we then immediately take, put the data in the buffer and then pass it back to our base class to do any last minute translation that needs to happen. Inverse for the right. You're basically calling your network objects to do any of the work that you need to do. You're passed in the buffers, deal with the buffers as you need to, set and throw any errors that you need to set as you need them. And in the case of writing here, we go ahead and since we've transmitted the data trans done and done the translation, then we take and erase the data from the, from the buffer. And that's the end of that. Status. Again, this came from an era when we were still doing very much Atari oriented here. So we have a couple of status bytes here. How many bytes are waiting to be received? Are we connected or not? If there's an error. status server, that sort of thing. And then we have for each protocol, each protocol can have a set of commands that it can also implement for special functions. Um, I need to see how best to implement this on systems like Atom and whatnot. For example, we have uh, accept a connection 
so that you can accept server connections that you're listening for uh, and see which is uh, close a client connection that you may have on a server so that the listening port is now free to accept another one. Server objects. We have a cert we have a TCP server object that you can use for opening up TCP servers, listening on server sockets. Client connect. So you'll see basically the protocol takes care of all of the various signaling. And this is easily probably the simplest protocol adapter of the bunch. There is also one for UDP that works much the same way. You'll see much the same patterns. And it even supports um, multicast. Where it gets interesting is now we have another base object that builds on top of protocol called FS for file system. And these are protocols that essentially expose file system objects. Why does it randomly decide to pop up that video window or not? It's weird. Okay, are you guys still there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so for network protocol file system, you have all the usual suspects, open, close, etc. <clears throat> but you also have functions for providing a directory listing, for doing file name translation. So you can convert long file names to eight characters with a three character extension if you need to. for reading and writing to files with or without a buffer, basically just generalized abstractions that really can help in this case. And we take that as well as implementing a number of common functions that you might want on a file system, such as renaming, deleting files, locking or unlocking files, making directories, remove directories, et cetera. And each of those are then taken by this right here, these different protocol adapt, uh, adaptations. And used. Open file handle, FTP object. We have an FN FTP object. for doing all of the protocol negotiations for logging into and dealing with FTP servers, as well as parsing the various directory output formats that FTP servers can output. There's a bunch of them. Like most of this code ironically is just parsing the damn FTP directory. It's kind of funny actually. Um, doing things like logging in, handling the state machine for logging in, parsing responses from the FTP server. And the idea here is to provide a nice little object that can be called by the protocol adapter here and just say, I wanna open the file. I wanna open the directory. I wanna log in. And you'll see in all of these protocol adapters, you'll see a uh, function called uh, for, for the file systems, you'll see FS error to error, which will translate file system errors. In this case, you see all the different FTP response types and what they ultimately map to.
So it's essentially, an, you know, a protocol Im implementing protocol adapters are essentially integration and mapping. Reading from file handles, getting directory entries, closing directory handles, figuring out how much of a file is still needing to be transferred. In this case, because you have FTP and FTP has control and data sockets, we have to keep control. We have to, you have to keep, yeah, to, 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 to keep up with the control socket as well as any data sockets that get opened. Special commands and so on. Same for FTP. Now FTP is kind of interesting because um, FTP connections can exist in a variety of different states and mapping this to a clean IO channel is interesting to say the least. Um, you can see that I've mapped all the possible HTTP result codes to things that make sense. But uh, you'll find, let's see, hold on. We have what's called channel modes for the HTTP adapter. And this is important because you can, the HTTP you might want to take and uh, deal with the headers of an HTTP connection. You might want to just deal with the body. You might be needing to send the post data of a post request. You might be wanting to set headers and you need to be able to differentiate between these different states so that you can basically put the data in the right and put the data in the right place. And the HTTP adapter uses a command called set channel mode to be able to take and set these particular states so that we can act whenever, um, whenever something comes down the channel, we know what it's meant for. And you saw earlier the aux1 and aux2 values. Well, the HTTP uses this to take and add additional, the, all the HTTP verbs to the connection here so that they can be used. Anybody have any questions so far? Uh, but you said that something is uh, not finished yet, uh, and uh, uh, because uh, Fuji M device has uh, two services and no 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 network uh, code, something like this. Um, if you're talking about if you're talking about SSH, right no now, one. huh? It, it wasn't about SSH. Okay. Okay, never mind. Maybe next time. <laughs> okay, if you, I mean, and that's the thing. If anybody has any questions, either inside or outside of this conversation mm. here, I, 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 I have, to, if you, if you, yeah, if you can better articulate it later, then yeah, ask me and I'll try to answer. I have a little comment also to the question about the fetching of ATRs and uh, TNFS works, works like that, that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, get and put uh, parts of uh, files on TNFS server. And that's why, for example, uh, one of my last videos on Facebook uh, Facebook groups uh, was about um, that I could uh, update ATR on my local T TNFS server and yes. uh, I, I have instantly um, compiled cross-compiled uh, binary on my AT ATR 
that is mounted uh, via Fortinet uh, device. Yes. So basically, there. I mean, you were using the you were using the Fuji side of things to basically just uh, move uh, disk images back and forth and and update them on the fly. That works great. You can yeah. also you can also use the network device to deal with TNFS files on a file by file level as well. You'll notice there is a TNFS adapter here. And the- Yeah, you know, yes, I can, but uh, it uh, provides additional data in the uh, user space in Atari. Yes. Because I, I, I should install an, an device. But if I'm, uh, I'm updating ATRs and uh, on the fly, it's like a uh, uh, lower layer. Uh, yes, it is. It is. And right? like I said, there are multiple, yeah, there are multiple ways to do this. Uh, and like I said, and, and here's the important thing too, the, um, you don't have to load the end device to use the end functions. Uh, if you look in the FNC tools that come with the Atari, you'll see a whole bunch of end tools, end copy, end directory, end CD, et cetera. Those use the FujiNet. Uh, as those use the FujiNet directly. They do not need the end. Of, they don't. They do not. They do not need end dev to be loaded. That's right. And but uh, but there is uh, on the some groups on the Facebook groups uh, sometimes a misunderstanding because uh, uh, as you re remember, one guy asked about uh, using end dev in CC sixty five. Yes. Right, and of course it's not necessary because uh, it has access uh, directly to SIO. Yes, correct. Um, Peter, when, when you um, modify the ATR file on your server from your desktop because you're doing development, yeah. do you have to, do you have to, do you have to, does FujiNet need to close and reopen that TNSF? No, it doesn't. No. Okay. But but one important thing is that uh, on the FujiNet side, on the other real Atari side or Altira side, uh, ATR should be uh, mounted as read only because yes. uh, when you uh, mount as read write, uh, that standard TNFS server will make a copy of ATR on the uh, server side, and uh, you will have. Uh, when you update ATR on the fly, you will update ATR source, but not the copy that is mounted retried for the device. Yeah. So if you want to do that, like like me uh, 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 um, recently, uh, you should mount from uh, FujiNet site ATR as a read only, and uh, you can uh, update in, uh, in the fly uh, ATR, uh, for example, with ATR copy or at ATR to dir or something like this. Right, right now I'm trying to update ATR to copy uh, with uh, uh, up-to-date uh, light DOS uh, uh, file system, uh, for example, to, to access uh, uh, huge, uh, huge uh, uh, storages, and copy from from macOS or or Windows uh, files directly to ATRs, uh, formatted with light dust. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really fascinating. I, yep. um... I I do that all the time too. It's a great. It's it's great for development of yeah, yeah. development workflows is wonderful. Um, I actually I use combination of both. Like I said, it's it's there there are multiple ways to do this, and it will be, you know, there there will be the best ways for every target system as well. So, I guess at this point here, you guys have kind of seen. We've got all these protocol adapters here. They all follow a similar, they all follow, follow a very similar pattern. They all map to their requisite file systems or protocols. And the idea is to take and map those down so that 
uh, so that they so that all we need to do on the computer side of things is basically to send commands uh, to take and either set different modes in a channel for reading and writing different things and to issue read and write commands to these protocols. And there's plenty of breathing room to add more protocols. So we can add one for IRC, we can add one for Discord, we can add one for talking to Slack, and this is kind of, or whatever. And this is important to understand because we have this large, comparatively large compared to the computer it's connected to microcontroller sitting here that can talk to the network outside. It can do encryption and it can do complex things because it has the memory to do things like doing JSON and XML parsing. So that, that essentially all we really have to do is provide a nice clean IO channel to the target machine to read at its leisure. So that at the end of the day, when you go to do any sort of software development here, I'll oh, take get rid of this for a moment. Let's see here. Mm, all right. You can talk to, you can do the programming and things in very, very simple terms. So on the Atari, you can write a terminal program in six, seven lines of code in basic or let's see. One more thing about accessing on the fly ATRs on the uh, server side, uh, because um, uh, last time I'm used to uh, um, I'm used to uh, to to update uh, and copy cross compiled code, but uh, there is another idea. For example, when you have real Atari. Uh, and the same configuration, uh, ATR mounted read, read only uh, from the local TNFS server. <laughs> and on your workstation, you could have also, for example, emulator uh, that has mounted that special ATR. Uh, but for example, uh, you could have uh, a special configuration that, for example, you have Rapidus or, or or just uh, a disabled uh, speed limit. And for example, uh, this is, there is a possibility to compile with max 65 or something like this, uh, 10, 10, 10 times 10, 10, uh, time, uh, faster than uh, on the real hardware and compile it uh, to the ATR and test it uh, on the real hardware. So yes. This is maybe not cross compiled, but uh, ten, could be ten, uh, ten times uh, faster than uh, than uh, on a real hardware. Very true. Now to tie this all together, the reason that we do that we go through all of this effort to write all this firmware code that builds these that builds these nice IO channels to talk to all of these, to talk to all these abstracted devices is so that on the target computers themselves, and in fact, let me make this a little bit bigger. Can you guys read that okay? Okay. Yep, I can read it fine. Okay. Yep, perfect. Okay. We're using on the Atom side of things, standard system calls to talk to the different devices on the FujiNet. That's the point. And 
nothing special here. And on the Atari, much the same. We go to Netcat. And we have functions that on the Atari amount to nothing more than standard device control block calls. That's it. That's the, that's the goal. That's why all this effort is expended. And on the Apple II, smart port calls. On the Commodore 64, standard uh, Commodore 64 kernel calls. The firmware's job is essentially to take this crazy complex world of the network outside and to boil it down so that it can be read to and dealt with by the standard operating system routines, assuming that they exist. So, is there anything that anybody wants me to go over on the target computer side of things now that we've kind of walked through the firmware? Sorry, can I jump in, Tom? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, at the moment, you said the devices that you're shipping are 16 megabyte. Yep. And it will, you can compile down to a four megabyte. Mm -hmm. module. Yep. Uh, just shopping in the circle of hell on Amazon, uh, I can see a lot of four meg modules. Uh -huh. I'm really struggling to find the 16 meg. So the question would be is, uh, would I be at a disadvantage by building around a four meg module? I, you know, at this point, I don't think so. Um, and the, using... the, 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 the key is to get a W rover, not a W room. Yes. A W rover. W rover. Yeah, we, we build on top of the, of the rover. And they're hard to find, although I did just see some on Amazon US site today, but. Um, yeah, but I mean, I've, I, I found one from a group that I've just ordered a bunch from, and it's the ESP32 W Room 32D. <coughs> uh, and they explicitly state that it's only got the four mega flash with it. Yes. Yeah. Um, the the, yeah. the the W rover has PS RAM that okay. we use, which we really yeah, which we really use, and um, yes, uh, it's the five hundred and twelve K is it five hundred and twenty K S RAM, something like that. W rooms, uh, uh, yeah, W rooms come with three hundred and twenty K of RAM. Period. And okay. Uh, that you'll run out of that real fast. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the it's the W rover that's got the external yes. memory. Yes. On a yeah, and I, I did. I recently I tried to compile. I tried to target FujiNet for a W room, and I tried to go and remove. I I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We wind up using a lot of yeah. We we wound up yeah uh we use a lot you know big chunks of ram in bursts for various different things and we really needed the extra ps ram yeah especially for things like oh you know pdf parsing you know building sam <laughs> yes sam building yeah building audio streams on the fly you know <laughs> that sort of thing um and, and right now, I'll have to say, it is hard to find W Rover dev kits. Yes. 
You'll have to probably grab them from AliExpress. Right now, yeah, we're all, yeah. Worldwide chip shortage, isn't it awesome? Oh, it's good times. I mean, oh. I got the 8266 model at the moment for playing with. Yep. I haven't set fire to it yet. <laughs> I still have a handful of the original. We started, that's that's actually where we started with the FujiNet. It was, it was um, 8266s, which we, uh, and then... Uh, Jeff went, uh, and then I was like, you know, we, we could do a printer, and we got off onto PDF parsing and realized, oh, crap, 80K for RAM isn't going to cut it. <laughs> so, uh, hey, those, things, those things still work. I still have one of those Mars Bars ones, and yep. I never updated the firmware, and you can stick it in an Atari, and it'll load a disk. Yeah. Yep, yep, those still... It was the whole. It was the whole move to add the virtual printer that went. Oh shit! We need a bigger boat. So, um, well, okay. Tom, will the will the ESP thirty two S two rover work? It should. Um, the um, yeah, it's a yep. slightly different core underneath, um, but platform IO supports it. I think we're going to have to make another target for it. Oh, you know what? I, I remember the problem with this. It's a single core. Yep, device not a dual not a dual core device. Okay, was, which which our code is not gonna. Yeah, make we'll have the to work code happy on the. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have to figure that out. We will have to figure that out. I have That's a, a I have an S three I have an S three here in the box, waiting for support. So is it is S three a dual core? Can't remember. Don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. it is. Okay, okay. Just Googling. Yeah. That that that's probably what we're gonna have to switch to. Okay. Once um platform IO <coughs> supports it, right? Yes. Yeah. If we want to add certain, yeah, for certain things. I think I've pretty much um exhausted unless somebody has something else that they want me to take and walk through explicitly here. I think I'm out of talking points. And I was wondering, maybe walk through if possible, let's say you wanted to, um, um, I guess dumb it down is the wrong term, but let's say all you got in your box of uh, toys is a, a room. Um, how would you compile for that and uh, determine what to leave out? Well, essentially, you can currently build for a room by going into uh, your platform IO, INI, and you'll notice that we have a, um, that's the thing. Oh, God, you'd have to make another target for this. Yeah. So in other words, it's, it's, it's pretty involved. Yes. Okay, no worries, no worries. Is right now all of our all of our targets right now assume that we have that you have uh, eight megabytes worth of PS RAM. Yeah. Okie doke. So and just kind of as a as a as a metric here at this particular moment in time, we are using on our production units. We're using roughly one third of the firmware space that's available uh, for everything. So we still have two thirds of our available firmware space available to take and add new features, to add more protocol adapters, to add more devices. Uh, there, there's plenty of room on these chips. The big thing is, is that we needed the we needed the PS RAM. So yeah. you need at least some you need at least some modicum of PS RAM. The, the PS RAM is more important than the uh, than the amount of flash that you have. Okie doke. And the sorry, and and the majority of the RAM is required for the printer aspect, right? Yeah, uh, it's, it's printer, and ironically, uh, again, uh, he, uh, Jeff mentioned Sam. We have a complete right, right. Sam implementation right here <laughs> that literally takes and spits out an audio file. Um, yeah, so, so Tom, I remember the printer 
we were writing the temp file out to spiffs and there wasn't enough. Yes. And you, yeah, you, and you really want, yeah, you really want the, you really want your paper not to be on spiffs, but on the SD card. Whew. But I don't recall that, that, that I, um, well, let me ask you this. I'm, I'm trying to remember. So I think in Sam, we actually do a PS RAM malloc. Yes. For the buffer to build up the, the um, essentially the wave file it's going to play. Yes, you do. Where is that? Oh, yes, you do. Somewhere in there. I want to. Although, so, so do you know, does the system, will it use PS RAM when it needs to without you having to tell it? Yes, by default, um, by default in the, um, yeah, we have the SDK set up so that uh, it will prefer to use uh, PS RAM first whenever it can and low RAM when it needs, and low RAM when it needs to. You can either do a standard malloc or if you explicitly want to take and uh, allocate from, uh, low memory or high memory, you can set capability flags. It must be in SAM.C where we do the Alec. Yep. There's a bit in here. Yeah, if someone can get it to compile on a room, it'd be good to know what they did. I, I, yes. I couldn't do it recently. No, it's it, it, the, the the project's got the project got big enough that that's no longer possible. Yeah, but it's uh, again not being a programmer. It seems like you just go in there, turn off Sam, turn off printer, turn off everything you don't need. Obviously, hack around a little bit. Yep, and eventually come up with a spiff that's small yes. enough. Yes, yes. And then take your fork and do a PR on it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. A bunch of, uh, if, yeah, what's a bunch of define, if defines. <laughs> yep, basically. Yeah. And anybody who wants to take and anybody who wants to take and do that work, we can take and help point them in the right direction and uh, just, you know, try to, try to help, try to help along as best we can. Um, you know, because if somebody wants yeah, to do the work, I, I think like a disc, maybe a disc and modem only, yes, would probably fit. I and mean, that's where we started. That's where we started. Yeah. But to be clear, though, right, Tom, like every FujiNet from the very first one that Moz did, the 1.1 hardware, they have the ro rover. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We standardized, we have standardized on the same chip, and we have been using it religiously ever since. The different yep. revisions in hardware, I, I know I've stated this like 80 billion times everywhere else, but the main differences in the hardware revisions have to do with improvements in device coupling with actual real world physical devices. And I mean that on a couple of different levels there because a couple of the revisions literally changed the shape of the SIO pins. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, one of them, um... Uh, included um, open collector buffers so that you couldn't bias the ESP from the Atari logic yes. Yes. signals if, if you had the ESP turned off. Um, and those also clean up the, the waveform on the SIO pins so that you can have, a, as Thomas likes to say, a whole stack of 1050s daisy chained off the FujiNet and still use them. For whatever reason, for whatever reason you would want to. <laughs> Although I, I, I did use a 1050 in the FujiNet to copy some discs. That was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, that was, that was pretty neat. Um, and, you know, and there were a couple of revisions where we literally had to figure out, we had to find, a, and this is kind of important to understand, nobody makes the damn connectors anymore. We've had to take and invent, retool and reinvent the damned Molex connector. And yeah, Oswald's a great, a great, um, he's crafty at that. <laughs> yeah. And we've had, yeah, we've gone through, so yeah, we had to, we had to go through several revisions until we found something that would not only accept the connectors, but hold on to them. <laughs> so, you know, because <laughs> there are different, you know, all the different types and everything. And anyway, but yeah. 
Um, so I guess that's pretty much it for me from here. Um, I, I, I keep asking because I'm not exactly sure uh, what, I sh what, I, what I should and what I shouldn't be covering here. I'm always trying to balance the line here. And what I tried to do with this particular talk was to kind of just do a real estate walkthrough of showing where everything is and how it all kind of connects together and how it relates. Um, I didn't show as much of the target device side of things because I make tons and tons and tons of videos on that alone. And the one part that hasn't been really addressed is dealing with the firmware. So to, do, to hack on the firmware, what you need is essentially copy of VS Code, copy of Platform IO, our code repository, and a GitHub account if you want to take and, and contribute. We accept pull requests from anybody. I will take and engage anybody and to, 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 to do active work on this. And I'm and hoping that the greater communities will take and engage, not just in target bus implementations for their systems, but also to implement things like the individual protocol adapters to add whole new, uh, you know, uh, abstract protocol functionalities, such as, you know, we, we, we still need to add NFS, for example, just, you know, regular Sun NFS. So, um, so, so Thomas, what are high priorities about to-do list right now? Leap SSH, uh, Yes, libssh2 lib needs to be replaced with libssh. Mm -hmm. And that might sound counterintuitive, but libssh is actually newer than libssh2. <laughs> Isn't open source amazing? So um, uh, that and uh, trying to think what else. What do you think? Uh, uh about that uh, Bluetooth stack, it will returns? The, blue, the Bluetooth stack, there are two, there are two, at least two ESP32 Bluetooth stacks that I'm aware of that need to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. And um, they need to, we need to see which one will work better because uh, Blue, Blue Droid, which is built into ESP IDF by default is a pig. You take if you take and disable Bluetooth from 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 the um, from the compile process and completely remove all the Bluetooth calls, you'll see a crater. This you'll you'll see Tycho crater open up right in the middle of your memory footprint because Bluetooth takes up a good twenty five percent of your of the available RAM, regardless if it's on or off. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not too thrilled about that particular Bluetooth stack in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. There are smaller, more memory efficient ones. And I'm mentioning this because specifically for those who haven't been following, uh, if we enable Bluetooth, we literally run out of IRAM space. The link fails because we run out of IRAM space. So um, we need to find a way to either get Bluetooth, Blue Droid to work or replace it with something that is a lot less resource intensive. And I am seriously leaning toward the latter. Is, is that the stack from Espress Eve or is it? Um, yes, it is. It is, okay. Yes. But I ask because I'm using it for something else. <laughs> uh, it's, that, damn, that damn Bluetooth stack is a pig. It is, oh my sweet Jesus, um, yeah. And, and it takes memory regardless of whether it's being used or not. All you have to do is reference one Bluetooth function and you'll instantly watch your memory foot, footprint disappear. So uh, the message to Fujinet users is to uh, add uh, uh, Fujinet firmware because uh, it's not like that that uh, uh, last summer uh, firmware is a uh, last uh, stable, but uh, uh, Bluetooth is not a first choice. But uh, but uh, 
the newest firmware has a lot of uh, improvements and a lot, lot of bug fixes. Yes. So uh, every, everyone should, should update the firmware. Yes. And also I tested, uh, I wrote a small uh, uh, scripts um, that download the latest version and, uh, and update and so um, uh, for my OCLI, and uh, I think it it is faster than uh, than from uh, Visual Studio. At least, uh, uh, for example, when I want to uh, run a monitor or serial port. Uh, it is instantly not building something or, or building uh, uh, for a file system for for forging at um, one second and I have a monitor open for serial ports. So yep. I can also share those scripts. I can definitely see that for sure. So yeah, I yeah, completely understandable. Um, and in fact, you know, I yeah. Uh, if you can, you can run all of the platform IO commands uh, from, from the command line. And in many cases, they will be faster, especially because there's not going to be a build task attached to them. Because this thing, because the, the tasks inside of VS Code really, they, they really want to run through the whole process of seeing, is there anything I need to build? And that takes a minute. <laughs> Actually, it's not a big difference between uh, the first uh, task building, but the second task, uh, upload and monitor, uh, <laughs> it is faster on the platform IO CLI. Yes. And uh, uh, it runs immediately. So one second and I have uh, serial uh, port monitor opened. Yep. Yep. Now, some of the other things that, you know, some of the other things that I'm working on too, as I'm taking and building out these bits and pieces, I'm having to, a lot of us that are working on target implementations are having to do things like communicate, make sure that we're communicating sanely on our, on our target bus. For example, many of us have logic analyzers attached to our FujiNets so that we can see what's coming across the bus and to make sure that we're talking to things effectively. We can zoom in and we can see things like the status request for an AtomNet packet and Atom uh, responding backwards. We can see the pack, we can see the bytes that we are sending along versus what we're seeing just come across the bus as is. And we can also see things such as when we have bus contention. If you see right here, this is a problem. This is not supposed to happen. Uh, this is a situation where I am talking out of turn, um, responding to something that I should not be responding to. And it's causing bus contention here and a corresponding framing error because I'm sending an acknowledgement packet accidentally when I should not be, things like that. And a lot of these things, if you can help with that, more, more is the better. We can take and attach these things together, pull them into pulse view, debug, and work back and forth with the firmware here to make sure that everything looks nice. And this is especially important when you're bringing up other targets. Actually, that's a good point too. And, and maybe, uh, maybe Jeff, you can talk a little bit more because Tom, what you're showing there, the whole thing about whether it detects a one or a zero based on the rise of a plus three, plus three or five volts or the edge of it, right? Did, and that's what I think I heard Jeff had said that he had to follow uh, for the smart port piece. Like what you have there, that doesn't actually show you edges, right? It's all just like, it goes up, it goes down. Do you, you need a more sophisticated piece to actually trace that or does it show you there? Like the transitions? No, it's just logic. So 
I was I assume it's like TTL compatible. Yes. So it's like a two and a half, two point four volt threshold. So yep. it works with the three point three volt logic. Um, I haven't confirmed that, but I'm I'm pretty sure that's what that is. So yes. Well, and again, I guess I'm asking someone who doesn't work with this at all, but just again, it's like still fascinated by it. Like in other words, for, for <coughs> this device's point of view is it just sees the state change up or down, but you yes. are trying to race and find out whether it's like the beginning of a state change, right? Or the end of the state change in order to do the timings, right? For smart port versus- Oh yeah, actually I I am- um... Right, it's like you have to almost see the uh, like- uh, Yeah, you, you, like, the analog, right? Not a digital- Yeah, you need an oscilloscope to do that. Yes. Um, and- uh, and the timings, like how how are you able to like get those timings in terms of like like your writing? So I'm doing direct I'm doing direct register writing for the for the digital I/O. So instead of using the helper functions, so the helper functions will do things like look to see, or am I asking you to to write a one or a zero, and then yeah. it'll pick which which registers to write to, and I ended up short circuiting all that and I just wrote a bunch of helper functions that um, I have to explicitly say, I wanna set or clear this pin. And so it removes that conditional, um, which which removes some latency. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. And I just I, pulled down your branch here. So, so go to the SPSD down in the live. Yep. Yeah, because I haven't, I haven't destroyed those yet. So. Um, yeah, yeah, there you go, right there. So, oh, th those are actually timers. So that that's that's the hardware timer, which is a forty megahertz tick, you know, forty megahertz counter. Um, and I'm only using the the lower thirty two bits of it, so you can do a single read to get thirty two bits. Um, and what's interesting about the IDF, the SP IDF, is it? So if you look at line one thirteen. So what that's doing is it's so that the ESP IDF has a has an include file that maps the data structure to the hardware yep. register addresses. So it's it's using timer group one, hardware timer number one, and getting the low 32-bit word value. Um, and in order to get there's a latch, so that one above that is it's having it load the 64-bit timer into the into the um into the latch and then you can read it um and then i and then i have some um i set it up with some constants to get one microsecond resolution yes and it's it's about a microsecond plus or minus 100 nanoseconds i would say um oh, wow yeah and, oh, and i a yeah. yeah, are you detecting these transition states? Are you basically, you've got this timer and you can nudge it forward or backwards, right? By like the minimum amount of these nanoseconds directly writing right to the pins. And are you just like nudging it back and forward till you get it, till you get it or? Yeah, you... oh yeah, trial, total trial and error. Yeah. Oh, okay. yes. <laughs> yeah, in fact, over over Christmas break, I, um, I, I just, I spent most of my time trying to create a waveform that I could see in the logic analyzer that looked right. Mind <laughs> you, he was doing this over remote desktop to his connected setup while he was at his wife's in laws. Yeah. In laws, <laughs> wife's his in laws. It's just fascinating, right? It's like you're driving completely blind with only instruments. In yes. A tunnel. And you're trying to like increment your accelerator brake like by millimeters, and then yeah. you don't run into the wall. Yeah, in fact, you'll see a. Um, oh, the other thing I had to do, I was just doing this during the phone call because I'm moving this SPSD. I have to give credit where credit's due. There's a smart port SD Arduino code that turns a like a standard Arduino Uno into a smart port hard drive, and I I did I took that and I converted it to ESP32 and they use assembly to do the uh, read and write packets and I I took that assembly and turned that into ESP32 C code C++ or C more like C code here yep um 
and uh, and and that's what all this stuff is here. And I and I when I originally did it, I was putting all the all the direct register rights in line here in the code, and then um, breaking wrote these out. helper functions so I could actually read that read it. Um, yeah, I like this send packet here. So this thing sends out a bunch of microsecond long pulses. Um, and uh, but if you scroll down a little bit more, let's see here. Oh, like right, right here, line five fifty one. I had to go fiddle, fiddle with it. But this is so that that timer adjust that um, constant right there. That yes. thing adjusts for some of the overhead of of doing the math and things like that. Yes. And then the the other thing I ran into, and I don't understand this, and I could be completely wrong, but. I think we're, I'm fighting like cash misses with instructions. Um, and so I ended up calling all the helper functions that I need at the top of a send packet so that I don't end up when you enter the loop, I was the first pulse was two microseconds long instead of one. Yes. And I'm sure it's something like a cache miss because I once, yeah. once I actually called all those functions up above, then yeah. it works. Yes, funny how that works. <laughs> yeah, even though I try to make them IRAM and stuff like that, I, I, I so yes. I don't know. Um, there, yeah. Could you be preempted by the RTOS at all? So I turned off interrupts, and I think what I need to do is use the protect macros around it. Yes. But I, I, I turn the interrupts off when I call this. Okay. So, so that yeah. should yeah. stop. Yes. You can yeah. you can enable you can disable interrupts. There's there are a couple of macros that you can use to do this: port enable and disable interrupts. And you also have um, uh, port enter critical and exit critical as well. Yeah, that's that's what I need to learn how to use because so I think that's probably better to you use. Can, yes, you can literally yeah. If if you need to that that that, that will that will ultimately save you here. And it's important to understand too, especially Jeff kind of mentioned in passing that, um, that, that the SPSD code was originally written in Atmega uh, Assembler. There was a reason for that. And that had to do with the fact that, the, that your typical Arduino at best runs at 16 megahertz Yeah, on a good day. Um, uh, whereas we, you know, we're running at 240 megahertz. We, we can we can afford to to write this stuff and see yeah and then I, i'm trying to do this in software on the send packet mm -hmm. um worst case if, if i can't get it to work consistently <laughs> i'll try to use the hardware based spy um interface um because that that can be run at like 40 megahertz accurately um, yes. but um yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I also found it fascinating, and I don't know. I mean, I know a little bit about Apple II's, but I was definitely more like a Atari guy. But you know, in the videos that have gone out that you sent about this boot up, and then the guy did the reaction video. What's fascinating is like everyone doesn't seem to be able to believe that it actually could work like, on a disc controller on an old Apple II, like off the network. So it's like. I definitely feel like you're pushing the Fujinet to its edge to be able to do this. I have no idea. I don't, I, this is my first Apple II project. So I'm just trying to copy what other people are doing and make it work. <laughs> well, it, it sounds like a classic case of like, you don't know that everyone says it's impossible. So you just went out and did it. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. That's exactly, yeah, that's exactly it. And it really needs to be brought home here that we are, I mean, really, really let this sink in. Um, we are abusing a disk controller to become a network adapter. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. something wonderfully perverse about that. Um, and uh, and just so everybody knows too, Waz knows that this exists and his response to seeing this thing work was just two words as fucking crazy. So, yeah.
Yeah, maybe that's taking the gears turn in the back of his mind. And we'll get some, it feels like uh, that would be the ultimate uh, uplift to help. Yep. So, I mean, as far as the, as it, we've proven that it can be, it's possible to do it on the Apple II. We'll see where we can take and move this to other platforms as well. But the goal here, the goal here is by the, by the time the end of this decade is out, um, we will have hit every single 8-bit micro and game console with a FujiNet. And also, too, I think it's critical that Jeff is not allowed to own any of these devices until we're ready for him to try to do the first boot. <laughs> you need to put filters on your google and everything you should know nothing about these hardware platforms at all <laughs> jesus christ and he has to do it over remote desktop <laughs> good god <laughs> yeah um well we have to we'll have to um we, we still need the hacking sessions at vcf east yes that too <laughs> and uh, i yeah and I'll, I'll i'll mention that too here the big thing that happened at vcf east i don't think i, I think we would have been stuck there for at least a few more hours if that random 20 something year old kid hadn't walked by stared at the oscilloscope and started talking to us yeah. Said, oh, awesome. do this, this, and this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was fascinating because that happened with an atom. If you guys are back at East on a table <clears throat> there with like a Commodore 64 and an Apple II, you're mm -hmm. going to have a crowd like 20 people deep nonstop. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. And Pretty much. A Coco, throw in a Coco 3 or something. Yep. I, like I said, I, I now have, I now have an official excuse to go to Kansas Fest this year. So, oh yeah, that will be a whole other level. Yes. And East is coming up soon. It's in April. Yep, April in, in, in April. Yes. Oh wow. Yep. So, okay. Um, God, what else? I don't know. Um, well I have I have some questions, and um, I know we were gonna talk. I didn't know if you want to do that during this session or after you're done. But ask, um, just ask, yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Just yeah, yeah this is open. Well, I've I've got a lot of I've got a lot of the code done for the for the sixty four, but it's I, I just need to move it into the FujiNet code, and and um, I know I'm gonna have to rework some of it just to fit into the, the, the framework. Yep. Um, and uh, I, I'm just going to need, like, what, what would the first, like, you're creating a new bus yep. completely from scratch, a new, uh, you know, new device target. What are the very first steps? <laughs> I mean, I know we, um, we go in, we create a, you know, folder in the bus. Yep. Go ahead, create a folder in the I mean, bus. Already have it. Hey, Boom. Right. We've got that. Hey, James. Uh, actually, yeah. be, even before you do that. Yeah. Okay. Um. Just what what I also what I did, and maybe it, it, this worked because it was fairly straightforward. I just I made that SPSD class mm -hmm. in the library that just had that just had my prototype in it. Yep. Okay but just turned into a class instead of, you know, and then all, all packaged up. And then right. I just got that running with FujiNet. So yeah. instead of like actually creating a bus object and a device object and stuff like that, um, I did like the bare minimum to get a new platform running, yep. which actually required a lot of things like creating a Fuji device that didn't have anything in it and creating a printer right. that didn't have anything in yeah, it. You're going to stub all that stuff. Just basically take, um, yeah, just take the, take the files in an, existing, in an existing device folder and bus folder and just stub all that out. Just okay. stub it, stub it, stub it, stub it out. Yeah. And, and then, then once you get that, just, just, just take your, take your meat <laughs> and stick it in the library. Okay, I think just part part of my problem is part of my problem is I've I've created my own um, implementation for 
the file system and network um, abstraction stuff already okay. too. Okay. Um, and it should be easy to just unplug that and plug something else in, but it's expecting a, um, it, it, it's expecting a certain object right now. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, so the file system, if you can use the FNFS file system and I just put in, I started with an SD a file on the SD card. Yep. Okay. And the, uh, the, yeah. the FNFS file system, that, that's a global object as well as the uh, FujiNet config. Yes. Okay. So I can just, I can just reference it in my code and yes. start calling functions. Okay. All yeah. Right. And actually you probably just want to do FNF, FNFS SD to start. Yeah. You can even just okay. uh, use that directly. That would be fine. Okay. So yeah, just um, take and bring your, take and bring your code in as, as, as one big monolithic library and start connecting and seeing what you need to do to connect the pieces in. And then as you figure it out, once you get it working, then you can start piecing it out into the individual classes. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, um, uh, I need to get started on that. Also, uh, it's still all on the 8266 as well. Um, just cause I started with that just like you guys did. And, um, I, I kind of wanted to push it to see how far I can get, how much I can get going with it. And I am hitting, I'm hitting memory, uh, out of memory <laughs> errors, uh, especially when I try to load a D64 from a, uh, uh, web server. Oh, yeah. It's uh, starting to actually. I think that would would work, but it. I think I'm doing too many requests yeah. to the server, and uh, it's failing because I'm reading around inside the disk image, and I'm using, um, you know, the accept ranges header to uh, uh, skip around inside uh, the file. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And actually, your work there, the, your work there for doing for handling accept ranges and whatnot. That would be extremely beneficial to fold into the HTTP protocol adapter here because that's not. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, you, Tom, you need to look at the work that uh, we've done on our uh, M file object. Yep. Because it, it wraps all of the, all of the network stuff and all of the disk image, you know, the media image formats. Okay. All into one object and it uses a factory. So you pass it a URL and it figures out it, it figures out based on the URL what what the uh, what objects it needs to instantiate to read the um, read the data out of the thing. So you can stack a uh, say you, you can put a D sixty four on a HTTP you know on a web server and you pass it HTTP colon slash slash URL. D sixty four slash file. You pass it that whole URL, and it will create all the objects. Go in and seamlessly give you read and write functions for. Uh, well, no write. It's all read only right now. But uh, you can pull it. You can pull it directly out of the um, out of the file, and all of the un the decoding just hap happens on the fly. Nice. Okay, I will definitely take a look at that. Absolutely. Yeah, and it and. Um, you can write uh, just like with FujiNet, you can write all these different protocol and, uh, image format functions mm -hmm. and it just uses it. Um, it uses the same kind of template, but then you have your own custom functions implemented in there to, um, to actually get at the data. I was able to, um, implement, uh, uh more than a, a handful, a uh, half a dozen or so different disk image formats after I got the very first one done in just a few days. Nice, very nice, cool. We'll have uh, to definitely, yeah, that's some of the nice things here. Cross-pollination uh, cross is, a, is a great thing. And that's why I'm hoping, I, I, I'm glad we were able to pull, pull you in. And I know that there have to be other projects similar to this being done by others that we can take yeah. and leverage, that we can take and bring together and leverage for, a, for, a, for a, an even better platform. So, yay, awesome. So we're yeah. gonna have- I've also, I have also, uh, I ordered some, some um, four pin DIN plugs. Okay. Um, 
So I'm going to, I'm going to take a stab at getting something going with dry wire on the cocoa too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, I've got a, a cocoa one and a cocoa two that have been sitting in my basement for years. And I think I've turned them on once or twice just to see if they actually work. Give I picked one of them up for like $2 in a thrift store. <laughs> and uh, I think it'd be cool to uh, get this going on there as well. So. Mm. All right. <sighs> do you okay. want, do you want to look at, um, uh, see what I've got on the 64 at all? Yes. Okay. Cause I've got it up and ready. I can, Hold on uh, a sec. Let me see if I can, sure. can I, uh, is that possible to take it? Multiple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Turn that on, I guess. Advanced sharing options, I guess. <laughs> Okay, uh, off, turn off that. Okay. Oh, I'm going to move this camera around so that <coughs> I actually see the 64 now. What, you don't have screen sharing on the 64? Come on. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just moving my <laughs> webcam around here. You know, it's funny while James is working on that too. Like, I just think about like the story of Fujinet, and I personally find it fascinating with all the devices. And now Atari was great. I mean, Atari was amazing. What you guys did beyond the pale. <clears throat> Adam, Atari is the best. I'm just saying. It is. The best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just hey. Being real for a second, maybe I've spent too much time around the people at BCF East in Wall, but like, you know, Adam was cool. Adam was esoteric enough to be like. And in some ways, it's actually like, what? You can do this on an Atom? That's completely bizarre. But to get to my point, when Commodore 64 and Apple II come online, I just think it's going to go bonkers. I hope. <laughs> as much as I love the Atari, uh, there's just, I've been for years at VCF East Repair Days and uh, only seen Atari one or twice, but there is always at least two people working on Commodore 64s and always someone working on Apple II. So... This yeah. is going to be really cool. You know, it, I think there's several there are several things that we 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 talked about early. I mean, first of all, working on <coughs> team because this is a lot of fun, right? This is a hobby, <laughs> and having friends to work with on it makes it a lot of fun. So you're just not like holed up in your basement by yourself, um, even though we're all online. And then we we decided to keep things with a microcontroller like we, we talked about cplds and fpgas and we the learning curve on those things is so steep not um, to mention expensive and they're expensive and that was the other thing too just keeping it as simple as possible on a single microcontroller unit has made this thing less than a hundred much i mean it's like I, I think originally they were like 60 maybe they're up to 70 now because you got to print cases and parts have gotten more expensive but still um, it's much less expensive than a lot of, um, I mean, even like an Atari, like the Atari S drive max is close to a hundred bucks. Yep. Um, so having this thing be a microcontroller and relatively inexpensive and having a fun team and then keeping it open source so that people can join or take it or whatever. And, and having the manufacturers come along, all the hardware is open sourced. And that that that's what's really made the yes. I think the Atari one successful. Yep. Um, and so hopefully we can do that on the other platforms. Oh, I think we will. Hey, okay. I, see, I'm, I see an action replay. <laughs> yeah, I love that thing. That's my original one when I was freaking fifteen. <laughs> Let me see spotlight. Yep. Here we go. <clears throat> that should yeah, I'm recompiling because I was I was working on um, um, testing uh, having some issues with the web dev on this. I had it working just fine. I, was, I run a web dev server on it so that you can connect to it from your computer and just copy files back and forth. You can directly from the flash memory. Nice. So you just mount it. You mount it like you would any other network drive, and you can access the files on the on the ESP and works pretty good nice but it's not working right now though <laughs> <laughs> funny how that works for demos 
Yeah. Well, I actually, actually, I was I was working on it last night um, because at some point it stopped working, and I'm not sure why. I haven't changed that code, but I, I think it may be memory related as well because the port isn't even listening. Hmm. So. Here we go. Come on. Oh, I also want to mention there's at least one or two people on this call that have started work on a FujiNet for the NEC PC88 as well, PD8801, etc. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was random and unexpected, but here we are. <laughs> Come on. Blinking. I, I'm I'm like I'm I am dead serious when I say I want to see this, I I want to see this running on a twenty six hundred. Oh, that would be awesome! Have you seen the uh, the cart that they have? The Uno yes. was it Uno cart or something? Is something? Or, no. Yeah, uh, they're using the STM, but then they're yes. they've got a an ESP01 connected to it to do all the internet stuff. Yeah. I think it could all run on just a 32. On just a 32. Yep. Yeah. I think it could too. Uh, and once we figure out, once we, dude, once we figure out a generic bus interface, it's over. It goes everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, hang on. I need to uh, transfer this and get too excited. But yeah, I would, I want to see multiplayer games where we have people on every different platform playing games together. Uh, yes. And I, I've been looking into um, creating a, uh, a, like a PlayStation network, Nintendo network, whatever, just for 8-bit. Nice. <laughs> nice. nice. I want it it's like our own version of Steam, but it yes. would be what would we call it? <laughs> yeah, it can use Neon, right? To actually, you load Neon, yes. see all the games, and then you pick it, yep. and that's when it actually goes out and loads. Yep. Like but, and also, Tom, Neon, Neon is yeah, Neon is a uh, Neon's a browser that somebody in the Atari community actually wrote, and that's kind of the weird thing. He wrote this sort of thing as a as a proof of concept hypertext browser that maps the Atari graphics system onto a markup language. And so anything- Oh, wow. Can, and the thing was, he didn't develop it with FujiNet in mind. He developed okay. it so that it would just use the central input and output functions. And helping. so- He wrote a game and that was like the help pages. Yeah, it was the help for the game. <laughs> awesome. <Yeah. laughs> And the thing was, he was like, huh, I wonder if this will work with FujiNet in colon HTTP. Holy shit, it worked. <laughs> That's awesome. So, okay, I have to check that out and see if they're uh, see if they'll <laughs> port, over, port over to the 64. Yes, yeah. I think, and that's kind of it. It's not, the, the idea isn't so much a one size fits all, but to kind of take a slightly different approach and try to make something that matches best with each target system and then try to find somewhere in the middle that you can meet. Yeah, I mean, you have a loose framework there, and yeah, and, you know, and plug yeah, into it a little bit, right? And and he's he's decoupled that now, where you can have an actual server component that runs on a Linux machine that can generate the output into Neon <coughs> and from like a regular web page or anything else you want. So there's there's some interesting. Oh my god, yeah, that sounds cool. I've, okay, I need. I'm gonna need some links so I can check that out. Well, it's on the Discord. Check out the Discord. It is okay. Yeah. Okay. This is neon. We made a whole page for it. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. So what what I've got right here, it's loading directly from flash memory right now, um, and I'm just brow I'm not. I have no DOS, nothing loaded other than just standard Commodore 64 Basic. So it it's um it's responding just like it's a 1541 drive, pretty much. You know, I can do a load a directory listing right there we go we'll get our listing here i can come up and um if i load something that is detected as a directory it automatically does a change directory um so if i come up here and i load games let's see if this is going to what are those funny characters oh. that you're pushing oh i'm sorry <laughs> Those are Sorry. shortcuts. Short, shortcuts instead of L O A D. 
you can do uh, you can do L shift O, and that's a shortcut for load. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> I'm used yeah, to. He's using he's using he's abusing the basic interpreter to do shortcuts. That it's a <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's like the that's token. Hack. It's, it's, it's the actual so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. L shift L shift O is is a uh, it's just showing the the graphic that's on that key. You know the uh, the uh, pet ski graphic. Yes. Yeah. So I do load dollar comma eight. There we go. There's our list, and that actually did not work. Whenever I tried to change directory, but if I do, uh, I need to fix that. But if I do load cd uh, cd um, space games. There we go. Now we get a listing from our games folder. And if I come up here and want to load one of these, oh, um, oh, here we go. Chopping mall. <laughs> <laughs> That's a this good movie. <laughs> comma eight, comma one. And I love the, um, the data stream output. <laughs> it's just, it's showing you what memory address it's loading it into on the yep. 64. Yep as it's going along. And of course, I've got a little bit of blinky going on on the um, ESP to show you that something is going on because this is, again, the world's slowest drive yeah, ever created. So. That's, really cool. That's really cool. And to show you how much I don't know about the Commodore 64, I didn't realize that you had like an active editable screen like you do on the Atari. And the yes. That's oh, yeah. Thing. Yep, yep. So it's loading, we're at 68, 69. Well, I was thinking about this, and the, this is going nuts. So on the hardware side, I want to put five RGB LEDs across the, uh, across the front of the device. And you can use the percentage from the uh, readout here to light up 20% every for each one of the LEDs as it's going across to give some kind of feedback. I don't know if that would, you know. Yeah, so we definitely need to do the deluxe FujiNet device with a little <laughs> right. load meter on the front and like disk space stats with a tiny little LCD screen on it. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. Let's run this. There you go. Merry fucking Christmas. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> From 1991. D Packers. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Can you guys hear that? Can you hear the sound from that? No, no, no. Okay. Faintly. No. Did Faintly. they make a game based on the movie? Was there a movie? Oh, yes, there was. Oh, it is an amazing movie. <laughs> okay. Oh, killer, you're just... killer robots. No, okay. okay. No, no, this is different. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> this is just your... You are uh, an elf running through the mall, just killing people. Oh, that's just so. beautiful. Okay, all right. All right. At, at Christmas time. So. Okay, there you go. Now, Chopping right. Mall, the movie is a very different movie. Uh, if, you, if you're a fan of, if you're a fan of B movies, '80s B movies, yeah, you need to watch that movie. It's, okay, it, it's amazing. Uh, the the a shopping mall deploys a security force of robots, and they go berserk. So awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So right there, I just loaded a, uh, a PRG file. Um, shoot. You know what I was testing, I was testing on here and I don't have any D 64s, but I got D 80 and D 82, which are abstract, yes. like old formats. They do. And, and I got those working, um, pretty quickly here. I'll load this D 82. And that's for those that don't know the, this is a, this is a disk image from a, an 8280 type drive or 8250 type drive. Uh, basically, they were Commodore had this weird penchant for making drives that could store a ton on 48 TPI media, and these drives could store a megabyte a piece. So you know. Um, but, also, something too that that I added to the directory listing. If you notice at the very top, I have some info lines that get added. So it shows you what your path is and what image you have mounted. That's nice. So you know where you're at. And also, if you're connected to a, um, a web server, if you're loading something from a web server, 
Um, it'll show the, uh, the scheme up here, the URL, so that you know where you're connected at. Um, but this is, this is the listing I just loaded from that D82, and it's, it's rather large. I have another Atari question, too. Is this normal how you kind of use BASIC? like a dos on the commodore 60 yes yes okay. yeah so yeah this is Atari. standard commodore basic you plug this thing in you don't have to load anything else um because it's 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 responding just as if it was a, a floppy drive yeah um, so, so, no no but i don't even yeah, hear that's doing like if you had a floppy drive on there you don't there's no dos no well here let me explain I'll, i i can explain this one here okay the, um the disk operating system doesn't live inside the Commodore 64 at all. The Commodore 64 or the Commodore in general, this started with the PET and extended all the way through the 8-bit line. They have a basic set of kernel input and output routines that can talk to a set of devices. And one of those devices, you can have the, the disk operating system, the file system lives on the ROMs of the disk drive in question. It implements the file system, it implements all the disk access methods, uh, everything. So all yeah. the Commodore 64, all the Commodore is doing is sending commands, open, close, you know, et cetera. And uh, the drive is reacting to them. And, yeah, and you the drive is a computer in itself. Yes. You can load a program and you don't have to worry about like basic being in the way like you do on the Atari. Typically what happens is uh, with machine language programs, there's a little chunk of basic in, at, at the front that mm -hmm. uh, acts as a, it, it's just a shim that's a sys command that just uh, jumps to the appropriate location once it's loaded in memory. Now if yep. a program file uh, has as part of its header, uh, the target address that it needs to load into. Right. And if you don't, if you, uh, you have to assist that address to launch that code or, or sometimes you're just loading in different um, files for different functions that the main program is going to use later. Of yes. course. So let me show you guys one other thing too here. And this is going to load from HTTP load. Um, and you, again, it's just standard Commodore 64 load commands. HTTP colon slash slash C64 load. Oops, that's a comma. Oops. C slash. And I was just put, I was doing like game of the year, whatever. This is just Ooh. an example. And this is going to load directly. Yep. There you go. It's loading directly from my web server. Yep. <laughs> and that's very cool. Very cool. So right off the bat, you you plug this thing in, power it up, and oh, not only uh, just like the the FujiNet, this emulates not just Drive Eight, but it can it can emulate any device ID from four to to thirty. Yeah, pretty much. And yeah, and, and you could have um, um, media IDs for each one of those devices um, up to. I don't know how many, I mean, it, it's really unlimited at that point because you can, uh, you can um, structure that command however you want, but typically it's just zero and one for the media ID mm -hmm. because you, you know, they had, they had disk drives that had two, yes. that could handle two medias, either one or two floppy disks or um, um, two sides yep. of the disk. So, so that you guys, yeah. So that you guys know the way that the Commodore, IO architecture is essentially set up. They pattern their device architecture off of IEEE 488, if any of you are familiar with that. And it started life as an 8-bit parallel IO bus. And when they brought it to the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20, they basically turned it into a serial bus. But the command structures and all the arbitrations, et cetera, are essentially the same. You have up to 30 uh, you have up to 30 possible devices and each of those possible devices can have up to uh, 15 uh, independent IO channels inside of those devices. 
yes. uh, of which the 15th is typically used uh, as the command as the channel. Command. Yes. Yep. So yeah. there's a, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's some interesting ways that you can pattern logical devices in, in the Commodore IO subsystem. Yep. What's this, uh, this project called that we're currently looking at? <clears throat> um, meatloaf. I, meatloaf. Yeah. <laughs> I named it oh. meatloaf. Here you go. So that, that finished loading. If you look down here at the bottom too, I added the syscall. Um, <laughs> SYS 2049. Um, for if you're loading a, a, a machine language program, it, you know, Meatloaf tells you in the monitor what the syscall is to, to launch it just as a little convenience thing. But I'm going to um, list this. There you go. Run. It's supposed to do that, right? Yeah. It's <laughs> I know. Deep hackers got to love them. <laughs> Uh, no, no. Boy, we wouldn't have any of these guys we if it weren't for the pirate groups. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so anyway, there's that one. Um, also, too, I don't know if this is going to work, but I want to try and show it to you. You know, uh, there's a site. It's called uh, CommodoreServer.com. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they have their own virtual drive thing. Yes. Um, well, we wrote a, a protocol adapter for that. So if you do... And let's see if it's going to work. It's having issues with it before. Let's see. Oh, you added Commodore server support. Nice. And it crashed. Okay. Hang on. Oh, hold on. Let's try Oops. again. Slash. <laughs> I was also adding a. Uh, yeah, it's crashing right now. I've got to figure out what's wrong with that. Um, I was also adding a, a, a scheme for, for meatloaf. It's going to just be ML mm -hmm. um, for loading from, from my server directly. And I'm going to build a, um, going to build a, um, a database and um, had, some, had some ideas. I'm going to build a database of everything that's available out on the net so that you can hit it from a unique ID from the server and just do load uh, ML colon and a, a code. Yeah. And, and it, will, it will load it direct, it'll go to the server, do a lookup on that code and then load it from another machine out on the internet somewhere. It's a magnet link. That's a cool idea. Yeah, 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 exactly. So um, the idea was that people could come set up on, uh, set up a profile at Meatloaf dot cc and then um register all of their their stuff there and have like short codes for everything that uh they can um they can load from their fuji net Actually, or their meatloaf that, device or uh, whatever that's a damn good idea i think that's i think that's something that we should approach that we all should subscribe uh, to. That's i really i am going i will make that i will make that work and i will make it work with with fuji net so. And, and you know what? It would be cool if it would understand from the beginning that there might be uh -huh. systems, right? So the FujiNet says this oh. is Atari, right? And it sends yeah. you the link for Atari, right? Because there's like summer games is across the platforms. If there was oh, yeah. short code for summer games and it doesn't care what platform you're on. It just oh, happens. that would be that would be cool. That Dude, I think cool. I think you just solved I think you just solved a, a major problem here, which is where is everything? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Discovery is a big deal. Like, Discovery yeah. is a big deal. Traversing There's also Minecraft servers is too much. The homes drive me, <clears throat> drive me wild. I don't want to see 26 letters, right, and figure out where. Exactly, to. exactly. And and there will be search capabilities too. Um, you'll just be able to hit a URL with a query string, and it'll it'll send back a directory listing of everything that it it finds, and you pick it yep. and load it from normal. Uh, and another idea on top of that is a little browser extension that if you're browsing from your computer, you can hit send to meatloaf or send to Fuji, send to yep. Fuji net. Yep. And it'll just post that URL directly to your, yep. your account. And then the next load, you do a special load command, like a load star or whatever. And yep. it loads that yep. automatically. Yay. Yeah. And you combine yep. this with the high score that they're doing over in Poland too. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. The guys in Poland are doing a high score database. So yeah. Oh, awesome. Yep. Awesome. Well, I've been I've already been working on um um 
web scrapers for for and web crawlers for going out and just uh, collecting all this data from all the different sites that are out there and uh, trying to compile it into a, uh, a decent database that can be used to locate the stuff that's out on the net. Oh yeah, um, we definitely, you could have some simple Python that could traverse a whole TNFS server and just yep. spit out all of the ID codes. And once we decide on like what a name for something is, it can just automatically match to existing short code. You know, I have some, I have some experience with that. I worked, um, I worked at AOL on Winamp Cloud, and I actually learned a lot on how to take and hash names for uh, sorting and identifying. So, oh, awesome. like sound X stuff, right? Sound X. Yes. Yeah. yeah, SoundX can be, yeah, you can use SoundX. We basically did a, we basically created what we called name hashes, meta hashes, and just a couple of hashes. And you would basically, one, uh, the name hash would have a certain priority over the meta hashes, et cetera. And then you would figure out from that what they could be talking about. So uh, I definitely will strip start. out, strip out the punctuation, strip out everything, uppercase, everything, smash it all together and then okay. build a hash. Ah, I, I've, I've done something similar to that. Yep. Um, it was, it was for creating a, a I called it a sort name. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that sound that sounds awesome. Oh, let me show you one other feature here too. And this is probably not going to work because Commodore server is not working. But on the um, instead of having stuff stored directly on the flash that's taking up a lot of space, you can create a, a, a .url file and just have the URL, it's just a single line inside that file stored in, in, in a file on flash. And whenever, um, whenever the, my M file class sees this, it, it knows to read the file grab the URL out of the file and then um, execute on that. Nice. Um, so you can have a, you know, the, the flash storage is limited on, well, this, this is an ESP with four megs, but um, it's, it's limited. So there's only a certain number of floppy disk images you could have on there, but you could store a lot of these on there and uh, directly load them. Actually, hang on, let's see. That's a nice, that was a nice, that's a nice way to address limited space. We just kind of, we want to okay. We'll add we'll add an SD card slot, but that's a very nice way to address that. Yeah, there's all sorts of fascinating nuggets in this project. Yep, this there is why I, this is why I love cross pollinating. <clears throat> See, now that's loading that same game of the year URL, but just it it pulled it out of the file that was already on the flash drive <laughs> or in flash, in flash memory. So, mm -hmm. oh oh oh, I want to show you something else too. Okay. Um, it can, it will, like if you pass it a URL directly to a web page, it will load that HTML directly into memory as well. <laughs> um, um, and I'm thinking for that neon browser, that would be yes. kind of perfect. <laughs> yep. Actually. So, and let's let this finish loading. Yeah, we, we could definitely oh. talk more about Fujinet about the Neon. Neon's a little bit different because it basically takes like a markup language, right? Mm -hmm. And wants to translate that into like Atari graphic primitives, like display lists and the different graphics modes with different text sizes. So, oh, wow. Yeah, you can, awesome. you can anything it, it, you can display on, a, on an Atari on an Atari screen, you can do in Neon. That is fascinating. Oh, wow. Fascinating <laughs> because you try to do display lists and it's very obtuse, but when you literally see it out, like in a dot file, almost like a markup file, it really uh -huh. becomes very clear about what you're doing and you get immediate gratification and feedback of what you did and then you change it and then you look at it. Oh, wow, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So yeah, doing porting that to C64, I bet there's there's definitely some common yes. um, fe features, I'm sure in the Commodore 64 in terms of like changing graphics modes and things like that. Okay. Here we go. I'm just going to load load Google. Oh shoot! No, uh, you sorry. tried to load the whole internet. Good job there. <laughs> <laughs> there. There we go. Load, and you can see the HTML coming in and the data over there. You see that? <laughs> oh sweet Jesus! Some obfuscated JavaScript and all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, so it's sending chunk chunk data, so I don't know the size of it, 
so there's no percentage and done. Yes. Yeah. So much for Google having smallest uh, homepage on the web. Right. <laughs> 15,000, 16,000 bytes. That's still not bad. <laughs> oh, and it crashed. It oh, crashed. Yeah. It yeah. must have loaded something into some memory that it didn't. Oh, oh yeah. 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 You, know, you know about FrogFind, James? FrogFind.com? I, yes, I have heard about that. You hit Frog <laughs> and it will, it will bring everything back to like much smaller, no JavaScript uh, HTML if you want. I don't know how... Uh, yeah, you can probably just pull its home page, but it will yeah. balance your search. See what that does. <laughs> be more reasonable. Oh, you know what? <laughs> the first couple of bytes, the first two bytes tell it the load address. Yes. So that oh, loaded. Uh, well, you... uh, well, that loaded into a place that it yeah. probably should not have loaded. <laughs> that's, that's why it's crashing. But, you know, if, if you're doing this programmatically loading stuff, um, you can pull data from any URL out on the Internet. Yep. You know, Just, yeah. <laughs> but it's freaking great. Um, kernel, yeah, use the kernel open routine, open the URL, pull, pull the stream in, uh, you know, grab the data, close the stream, et cetera. Much the same thing, much the same thing on Foodinet. And we're proving over and over again, speed is not everything. Integration right. is everything. Right. Oh, code. Hang on one second. Let me show you this. Okay. That's probably really hard to see, huh? <clears throat> um, well, uh, I was just going to show you the, um, the way we structured this. I'm glad we're recording this for posterity because for many people, this is literally going to be the first in-depth demonstration of uh, the uh, of meatloaf, actually, and okay. bits and pieces that will be coming to Fujinet. Oh, here's the file system. Um, the M, M, it's uh, M file is the is the class, yes. but oh, we've got all these different. We've got um, oh, the plan is to support archive types too so you could have you could have a zip file on a web server with a d64 image inside of it and a file inside that d64 image that you want to load and you yeah. just create this long url http colon slash slash web you know domain slash um zip file name slash d64 file name slash file name yeah. and this thing just figures it it figures it all out this is the uh the header for the class. Um, so we've got all the different media types. These are all the ones that I've done so far. And some of these are non-standard types. This D8B is um, a, <laughs> I just did it for fun because it was really easy. Look at this. Um, there's the header file. And it's, it's, uh, it's inheriting from D64 file. And yep. then to add support for this, that's it those those two files and now i've got d8b support which is a uh non-standard format created by um um the backbit i don't yeah. know if you're familiar with backbit yeah. but um so this could handle uh d8b files now just with those two those two little files um, d64 um most of these formats are 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 inherited from d the d64 file format and they just have different um different header offsets uh directory listing offsets um the block allocation map is a little bit different and the number of sectors per track so i um hey James. I, yes and i i know i asked this on bujanet but i don't know if you answered but the whole uh you know epics speed load cartridge and all that what you're doing now are you able to get around that or are you loading at that slow commodore speed right now it is loading at the standard commodore speed but if you look um, i am i've already got stuff stubbed out for doing here let me show you drive i've broken it out that's the command um where is it where is it where did i put it um, 
IEC. Oh, here we go. Um, I've got my IE, I've got protocols here, and we've got I've broken it out into different protocols because the way it works on the Commodore sixty four, the um, the way a fast loader works is the first thing that's loaded in is some code to modify the kernel on the 64 side and on the drive side. So what we have to do, because we're not emulating a full drive, is we have to detect what loader, what fast loader they're trying to use and emulate that fast loader. Because like I said, when you, that cartridge actually sends code to the 1541 drive to modify the internal um, routines. Yeah. And most of, most of those routines are just um, timing yeah. for the actual send and receive functions. So I've, um, I've broken that out and I've created protocol classes and I, I still haven't got these hooked in yet, but what they're going to do is, you, you know, you'll have an epix fast load function here that's going to um, override the standard send and receive byte functions. Yeah. Well, the, I, I would imagine fixing it on the drive is easy because that's what you're building from scratch and emulation. But on the Commodore 64, like when you turn it on, it's like a cold boot. On the Fusion, yep. on the Atari, right? There's a whole thing about, it looks on the SIO port. It sees if there are other devices. And if there's nothing, the FujiNet loads, it's like config. Uh, program is there something like that on the Commodore, like where we, you'll turn it on? Fujinet's the only device connected, say, and it can auto load like that handler that would then patch the Commodore's half. Well, right. What I what I was planning to do, and I haven't gotten that far yet, was there there are some standard uh, or some fast loaders that people have written just recently that are pretty awesome. There's one called Transwarp. This is it right here. So what I was going to do is say, again, you turn it on, you don't have a fast loader cartridge plugged into your computer at all. All you have is the FujiNet or Meatloaf um, plugged in. Uh, and all it, all it knows is standard, you know, uh, all it would, by default, it would just be loading standard C64, CBM, whatever, uh, IEC protocol, just that standard um, serial protocol. So I was going to use something like this Transwarp, uh, and there's some others out there so that um, if if the uh, if the FujiNet is if this option is enabled, what it would do is you send a command to say, "Hey, I want to load um, um, Pacman.prg." Okay, if this command is if this uh, feature is enabled, what it really does whenever you send that command is it loads this Transwarp program into memory and passes Pacman.prg as the uh, parameter for this and uh, chain loads it. So it, um, it loads in this fast loader first and then actually loads the PRG file. Okay, yeah, so you'd wait till someone actually wants to load something yes. and catch yes. it, yeah. There's, you would, you would cha chain load it like that. Yeah, yeah. They, this, has, this comes from the fact that, well, the Commodore 64 and the PET doesn't, don't really have mechanisms to automatically load something from the drive, neither does the plus four uh, or the CBM2 devices. Those things came essentially very late in the Commodore's lifetime with the 128. The 128 does have auto boot capability. And that's a yep. whole different, that's a whole different ball of wax. But so he's having to take and basically do this chain load as part of the initial request to the drive. Right. Yep. Right. Okay. And then and then you don't need anything other than a standard stock Commodore 64 and this device. Yeah. yeah. And I imagine that little bit that loads in before it patches is pretty tiny. So that. Helps. Oh, it's it's like 256 bytes or something. I mean, it's, or, or um, uh, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Less than yeah. less than um, a few blocks or you yeah. know, maybe yeah. just a few blocks. Um, so it's super fast. Uh, let me show you this too. I showed you the media, all the different media file formats that I've got going here. Um, I still need to get G64 support working and some of these other, well, some of these others aren't done yet. Um, SCP, I don't know if I'll do that one or NIB. And this HTAP, I just found out that's a, that's a tape file format, a high definition tape file format yeah. and uh, T64. Um, some of these I've just stubbed out. I don't know if I'm gonna do them or not. Uh, it was just for fun. And also cartridges, 
that's not going to be there are some cartridge file formats like easy flash that are really just file systems inside of the crt file mm -hmm. and um i was going to try and and parse those on the fly and make them act like a disk just just for fun okay um i separated things out into media and schemes these would be your network adapters your protocols so we've got cs for the commodore server um I put AFP in here and um, FSP is really old. I don't know if, if Tom, you probably I, know FSP. Yeah. <laughs> it's really <Yes>. old. Yeah. <laughs> uh, FTP, of course, HTTP, HTTPS. Um, um, I was going, I was going to create a scheme just for IEC directly too, because eventually what I wanted to do, and this is something that was not done on the 64, <laughs> um, all of, all of the modems connected to the user port, but I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be able to create a um, IEC-based modem, yes. a virtual modem at least, and, um, and use that for you know, connecting to BBSs over the internet. Yep. I mean, of course, on the 64 side, you'd have to modify or write a, a, a driver for that so that yeah. instead of using the user port, it uses IEC, yep. but um, I was planning on doing that on the 64 as well. Um, Little FS, I, I'm I'm using little little FS for my file system for the flash storage rather than uh, spiffs. Yeah, spiffs. Um, yeah. Spiffs. Um, but it's easy enough to change these out. I mean, I can add a, a spiffs. Actually, I got a header file down here. I haven't built it out yet. But using the this this M file object. I can create any scheme I want for accessing any network um, uh, device, any well, using any network protocol or any file system protocol right here. Um, you just create another one and it figures it out on the fly uh, nice. using the factory when you pass it the URL. Of course, the URL scheme is just, you know, standard, a standard URL type of um, uh, scheme. So uh, also SD here. Um, and I know that on FujiNet, you've got your, your, um, um, your, your translation yes. between a task and, and, and ASCII or whatever. Yes. Um, we're going to, I was going to use wrappers here for doing those different kinds of things. Actually, where is, we had one <laughs> that was for translating, um, Petsky to ASCII on the fly and you just, you pass it the URL and it automatically does it. it. It translates it back and forth on that same M file object. Nice. It's pretty awesome. Uh, one of the guys that has been uh, um, helping with some of the code uh, did most of this work and he just did a fantastic job. Excellent. So, um, but all of this stuff I need to get over to FujiNet and in um, ESP32 working format. <laughs> so, um, but that's just kind of a quick, quick Excellent. overview of what I've got here. Um, the main, the main functions that we're going to need on the FujiNet is everything that's in this bus um, library right here. We've got our IEC device. Yep. Um, IEC host is not needed right now, but that was plan for some other functionality later that I wanted to do. I wanted to, um, on the, on the 64, there's a device called zoom floppy that allows you to, um, connect, uh, 1541 or other Commodore drives to a PC and dump disc images from them. And I was going to, I was going to, uh, replicate that functionality using this IE host object. Nice and maybe do it through a web interface even. So you connect to the web interface of the device, um, pop a um, floppy disk in a drive that's connected to the bus as well, mm -hmm. and, and tell it to um, dump the image and it would, it would uh, dump it to a D64 file or, or whatever and just yep. you download it directly through the web interface. I thought that nice. would be kind of cool. But the, um, this is the um, actual IEC bus code here. And this is this is all the stuff that I've got to hack up to um, load into FujiNet. Yep. I did add IEEE 488 here 
so that we could possibly do um, parallel transfers through the user port on the 64. That would further increase. I mean, that, that would that would be the fastest yes. um, way to load data into the 64. And there are some um, there are some um, devices for doing that that, that use um, the Dolphin DOS and yes, for those. And there are actual IEEE 488 interfaces that Commodore released and others to take and use those hardware. And it also yeah. means just by virtue of it being implemented that way that, well, this will work on the PET too. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be awesome. And um, also, of course, Jiffy DOS support. I've already got detection working. Um, and it was kind of interesting. I can show you this if you want to see it. Um, let's see, where it is. The way Jiffy DOS signals that it's available is when um, the system, here, let's see, let me find it. Just like service. And you see, it's probably in device. No. Uh, All right, gotta find it here. In the, uh, oh, no, 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 it's in, um, it's in the transfer routines, CBM standard serial. Here we go. Uh, when it receives data, the last bit that it sends is delayed a certain amount to indicate that um, that Jiffy DOS is present. Okay. Wow. Right here. If there's a delay before the last bit, the controller uses Jiffy DOS. So I'm detecting that right here and um, just flipping a flag, Jiffy DOS active. Um, I, I don't have full Jiffy DOS support yet, but I'm at least detecting that it's active yes. on the uh, host system. And then I can activate it and switch out the protocol from yep. standard CBM, CBM standard serial to Jiffy DOS. Yep. And uh, that's, that's how I'm going to, that's how I was planning to, for all of that to work. And the same thing with um, if you get a memory write or memory execute command from some software, um, I was gonna use the same way the SD to IEC does it. They just, from what I understand, they, they do a hash of the um, data that's being sent over to figure out which, which um, fast loader protocol is being used. Yep. And then they, yep. switch, they switch it out on the fly. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's what I'm, trying to implement here as well. Excellent. So. That is that is awesome. I, uh, yeah, good times ahead. This is amazing. Yeah, I can't wait to see it fully functional and, and, and see us playing our first, first cross-platform um, game. Yes. I yes. wanted, the very first one I wanted to do, and I don't know if, uh, well, have you seen, um, like uh, Spilo Pong? Nope, actually. No, I haven't. It's like a 3D Pong game. Okay. Um, I think that would be awesome. You've got an Atari on one end and a Commodore on the other end yes. playing this 3D Pong game on an 8-bit computer. That would be cool. <laughs> that would be cool. Uh, we actually did a little demo not too far back. Kay Savitz wrote this little program that basically bounced... Uh, bounced a ball from uh, bounced a ball from one from one node to the other, and so I loaded a copy over here on my machine in Texas, and he loaded a he loaded a copy on his machine in Oregon. Then we yeah. connected up through Skype, put our monitors together, and watched it bounce across. <laughs> that's awesome. That is yeah. so awesome. Yeah, the uh, video for that's up on YouTube as well. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Here in Poland, uh, we have upcoming uh, food, ne food Genet network games. So Bochano working on that. And uh, yes. also um, I will work on the casual games service, chess, checkers, etc. cetera. Nice. So, so, so this, this is the year of uh, those games. Very nice. Yeah, it's, there's, all the participation. This is what I. This is what I wanted from 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 day zero, and I'm glad this is coming together. I'm so happy beyond words. Yeah, 
I'm glad I found you guys too. I uh, I was more than 80 uh, users on the new Discord group, uh, Atari 8-bit programming. Yes. Uh, and I'm trying to, to uh, make some uh, uh, videos about how to set up uh, uh, the development environment for, for coding uh, using Fujinet also. So very cool. Very, very cool. Uh, all right. I think, yeah, I think everybody's about to fall asleep here. So I think we're going to take a <laughs> cut it off here. But I think yeah. overall, uh, this was a great, this was, this started off as a walkthrough, turned into a summit, and <laughs> it um, uh, turned out to be an extremely productive meeting. Now, I have been recording all of this. And I will take, and as soon as everybody hangs up, I will stop and I will figure out how to get that recording out of Zoom. Hopefully I can do that. Hopefully they don't do anything stupid like, oh, this is in Zoom's proprietary format. Um, we shall see. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Awesome, okay. awesome. well, thanks, thanks, Tom, for putting this together. And I'm going to have a lot of questions for you as I yes. start moving this code over. Um, yeah, yes. I want to thank you too. Thanks, Tom. This has been fascinating for me. You're welcome. You're welcome. And welcome. Thank you to everybody who's come. This was absolutely fantastic. And um, for things like this, for programming workshops, whatever, I need everybody to really understand. I have limited amount of time for engineering, but I have infinite amount of time for teaching. So ask me, or let's try to get things together so I can impart my knowledge onto all of you and to everyone who is interested, because I want to see this thing grow. Yeah, awesome. Yes, thank you. Cheers, Tom. Um, all right. I shaped a lot of ideas. Thank you. Having Europe right. is going to sleep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I'm going to go lay down because I'm <laughs> technically supposed to be sick. I am sick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All, All right. right. Thanks, guys. No problem. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.